even if you make 1% change to the sequence, you already have billions of possibilities. And I'll just point out, no one can explore this space in any exhaustive fashion. So we have to have exploration methods that allow us to go out into this space and find one of the really rare ones that's functional because most sequences, let's say if you put them together randomly, and I always point out Jorge Luis Borges' book, our short story, The Library of Babel, the, the probability of finding anything really meaningful in this library of all possible books is, is essentially zero, and it's not much fun for the librarians there. And the same is true for those of us who explore sequence space without a strategy. So we have to have a strategy. And for me, that strategy has been the strategy that has worked for, for <laughs> forever of, of the biological world as we know it. And that is evolution. And if you just think about it, all the remarkable proteins, and in fact, everything from molecules to ecosystems has been engineered using this very simple algorithmic process of mutation and natural selection. And it has created a vast array of functional molecules. Of course, it took, you know, three and a half billion years and, and, uh, and lots of tries and effort, but it's a, it's a process, an algorithmic process that works tremendously well. So it wasn't surprising that one should use evolution, let's say, to explore the future. And it's instead of natural evolution, of course, it's artificial selection, where I decide as the breeder of molecules, who lives, who dies, who goes on to parent the next generation. And that's work, worked very well for making proteins for human solving human problems. So we call it directed evolution. And you know, for you engineers in the audience, it's, it's a simple molecular optimization process on a fitness landscape where we plot all the sequence possibilities, you know, collapsed in two dimensions for this simple diagram. Uh, we plot the fitness against those sequences. And it turns out, you know, some, some smart people thought about this long before I did. Uh, if the landscape is very rugged, as on the left, any mutation will send you into crevasses of known function and evolution stops. And that's clearly not the case. So I argued that, that the sequence space, the landscape there has to be smooth in some of its dimensions, more like on the right. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. And if, if it is smooth in some dimensions, then you can apply very simple search strategies. And the very earliest search strategies for that was, was uh, make a few mutations or recombine, but not too much and uh, put, use simple molecular biology techniques, recombinant DNA techniques to uh, put that mutated DNA in. And then comes the hard part for the human being. And this remains still the hardest part, which is how do you measure rapidly, you know, some number of sequences uh, enough to find a few that work and in the old days, we would throw the ones that don't work, that are not better than what you started with. Uh, and when I say better, the performance, again, is dictated by me. I'm looking for some properties. Let's say uh, uh, you catalyze this reaction in a different environment, or you work in a laundry machine, or whatever it is. If you design this screen properly with a, a low coefficient of variation, you can find the small changes that you expect, the small benefits that you expect from a small number of mutations. And that cycle, which is a, a you know a test and repeat uh, cycle, is one of evolution until you find what you want. So it looks a little bit like this. You're optimizing uh, a native enzyme that does its native job well. It's been a you know, product of evolution. So it's usually pretty good at what it does. But if you ask it to do something new, and I love the example of asking an enzyme to work in a laundry machine, it's generally less enthusiastic about that, no surprise. But through this process of mutation, a little bit at a time, or a little bit of recombination uh, and screening, you can push it, turning the crank 
up this new fitness peak so that it's pretty good at what it uh, is now being asked to do. And this process, surprising, it's the stupidest optimization strategy you can imagine, but given that it's costly to, 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 um, to monitor, to measure and screen, this process has worked very, very well. And I'll just show you a picture that has some of the thousands of products that have been made and optimized, everything from the reagents in your DNA sequencing to pharmaceuticals that are manufactured using optimized enzymes and biocatalysis, uh, and, and many bulk enzymes used in, in various industries. And I'll just share with you, that earned me the greatest accolade of my life, this simple process when I was invited to go and appear on the Big Bang Theory set uh, at Warner Brothers Studio. And um, <laughs> I don't know if any of you watch this silly show, but uh, I was the only first and only woman to play herself as a scientist on this show in 12 seasons. Uh, but it, it was a fun, it was a fun activity. But what I'd like to talk about next is how do you innovate? How do you use such a simple conservative optimization process to to access chemistry that you can't already find, right? We have this optimization of something that exists, but what, what about all the chemistry that, that humans invented? The chemistry that's the basis of our daily lives. It's not done biologically. It's done using human chemistry, pumping oil out of the ground and converting that to plastics and you name it, uh, things we rely on. I'd love to see biology do that. And this is a hard problem because novelty is not what we usually think about with evolution, but we should think about it because nature creates novelty all the time. Nature creates new enzymes doing new chemistry, often in response to challenges that we place on our biological world by dumping this potent uh, herbicide, for example, atrazine onto the planet and at first it was thought to be non-biodegradable, but then some smart microbe about 50 years later found out that if it cut off the chlorine atom, it would give itself a very rich nitrogen source. And so that enzyme and that microbe suddenly went all over the world and now atrazine is biodegradable. But it's a very good example of how nature can innovate and do this new chemistry in real time. So that gave me some ideas because what happens is that didn't just show up, right? It didn't just, nature didn't just create a new active site positioning multiple amino acids simultaneously because the probability of that is zero. Where it comes from is that, is that, uh, that, that activity is already there in the diversity of the biological world. It's a promiscuous activity. We call it promiscuous because it's a side function of something that's already biologically relevant. And if that's the argument, that if we can find these side functions, then we can use directed evolution to create novelty, just like nature created novelty from grabbing some poor enzyme that was really happy doing something else and pulling it in to do this new job. So I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. As far as we know, there's no enzymes, there's no chemistry in the biological world that incorporates silicon into organic compounds. You know, there's silicas that are sand that's pulled up into plants, but there's no organosilicons. But if you look around the room you're sitting in, there's probably 50 or more examples of organosilicon compounds from paints to sealants, caulks. You've got it in your hair gels and your earbuds. Uh, we rely on these uh, siloxane compounds that are made in megaton quantities, and they're not biodegradable. And we're making a lot of these, but we never do it biologically. So I, I thought it would be a lot of fun to see if we could invent an enzyme that would make carbon-silicon bonds. And in fact, there's lots of chemistry. If you just look at the carbon X bonds in biology, we have to nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur, a little bit of metals, 
you know, but there's whole swaths that are black in this periodic chart, which means that there are no biologically relevant uh, enzymes that make these bonds as far as we know. So, so this was uh, an example of how we could create novelty using evolution. And we hypothesized that a heme protein could activate carbon in the form of a carbene. This is chemistry known to human beings, but not as far as we know, known to nature, that it could activate carbon and transfer that into a silicon hydrogen bond. Now, that's just a hypothesis, but if we go and test the biological world. So in fact, we go to my refrigerator, we go to databases and pull out various uh, heme containing proteins. We found this little protein from a hot salty pool in Iceland, super stable. You can even give it to a chemist and they won't know it's a protein, but it catalyzes carbene insertion, forming a new silicon carbon bond, as well as any human chemist did for this kind of chemistry. And it's very selective, really quite remarkable. And obviously, this is not its biological job. It just happens to have this promiscuous activity. Now, I had a lot of fun with this project. Um, uh, a lot of people said, oh, that's impossible because that protein has no active site, et cetera, et cetera. And they, you know, if you run your little computer ball over it and try to calculate the active site volume, you come up with a big fat zero, but you know, <laughs> nature doesn't care about your calculations because this protein catalyzes reactant and it also evolves. So just three um, rounds of directed evolution, we were able to make a beautiful catalyst uh, that was enough to get into a snooty journal for publication. And, and I'll, I'll share another funny story with you. Um, nobody read our paper because it was 140 pages of really boring supplementary information on every new molecule we made. In, uh, but everybody read the science story on it saying we're making silicon-based life. We, we said nothing about making silicon-based life in the paper, but that went all over the world and got us lots of attention. But the main thing I want to share with you is that this novelty is available to us. New chemistry is available to us. And in just one and a half years, we were able, able to add boron and silicon to the periodic chart of life. And that got us, um, you know, people, I think they open their minds a bit about what biology can do and can do better than what human beings do. And in fact, Dow Chemical approached me and said, well, gosh, if you can make these bonds, can you break them down? Because that's really a bugbear for us. These volatile methylsiloxanes that come out of all of your consumer products and go up into the atmosphere and come down onto soils and waters, they're not biodegradable. And they are accumulating in the environment, and some are even banned in the EU. No enzyme has ever been reported to break these bonds. So they um, challenged us to develop an enzyme that would, a novel enzyme that would do that. And I'll not, you know, belabor this, but just in January, we published the first enzyme that breaks carbon silicon bonds, thereby opening this possibility for biodegradation. We're still a long ways away from it, just as we are from, uh, for example, using enzymes to break down plastics, but it's in the realm of possibility. And that's where I'm excited about biotechnology and by evolution. And that is that, you know, the biological world is the greatest chemist on the planet. There's no human that can mimic the, the, the selectivity and the beauty of, the, of this chemistry. And furthermore, biology can use renewable resources, right? Carbon dioxide and sunlight and, and recycle waste materials. And this is the kind of chemistry that we need to be able to do couple other points. Let's get into the, the computational part of this. And where does machine learning and AI come in? We had a project not too long ago that uh, where we evolved activity on a, a, a particular reaction, but we got the three-dimensional crystal structure of the evolved protein. And um, that was exciting. Sometimes it's very hard to do that because we compared it to the alpha fold. I'm sure you're familiar with the alpha fold being able to uh, fold proteins, all the proteins that were ever <laughs> discovered 
we used AlphaFold to model this new protein for phasing. And it gave us a pretty good model, but you can see that that little hole in the middle of the white side is, is there's no access for substrates to come in and do chemistry. But a single mutation, according to the actual crystal structure, pulled a, one amino acid out into the solvent. So that blue amino acid forms now, uh, takes a helix to a loop that creates this new pocket that goes into the active site. And what it tells us, this is an important lesson, alpha fold is great, it's fantastic, but it cannot give us the details, the details that are important for function. So it cannot predict or evaluate the effects of mutations, which is deadly to me. So let's talk about this. We have this optimization process, and it is, uh, it, if we have a single optimum, that's no problem, but we know that the world is not made of single optima, that, that protein evolution, especially for new chemistry, is going to require that we search a much more complex sequence space. And we get caught on a local optimum using a greedy uphill walk strategy. But if we use machine learning, we can change the evolutionary paradigm a bit to a you know, a trade-off between exploration and this exploitation to get the uh, local optimum. So we, in about 10 years ago, started inserting into the paradigm. If we're looking down, now we're looking down on the fitness landscape. If we insert modeling, you know, it could be neural nets, it could be Gaussian processes uh, into that, then we can start exploring a, a broader array of uh, of the landscape and home in on very readily onto, let's say, better optima that are nearby. And so given that, we now insert this machine learning model into the directed evolution paradigm. And with that, we can also take in all sorts of other knowledge in multimodal models um, and have a much more efficient exploration of this space. But it doesn't stop there. And this is where I'll end my remarks is, uh, for example, you could imagine since all of the steps of directed evolution can be automated, there's nothing in there. And none of those steps are, you know, require a human in the loop. All of that can be automated as you heard from uh, the Cloud Labs presentation yesterday. And now you can combine an intelligent agent right, this model or this intelligent agent to infer the sequence function. Basically, that's what it's doing is modeling the sequence function landscape from the data. Then you design new proteins to exploit and, and, and Phil Romero's using a Bayesian optimization process uh, in, a, in a learning cycle, right? So that then feeds into the automated experimentation and then you design, you use this um, to design yet more, uh, more variants to test, and you can automate the whole learning cycle. And I'm hoping at least someday soon that we'll be able to free the graduate students from this very painful experimentation and um, rapidly optimate, optimize uh, novel proteins. And I strongly recommend this uh, first uh, exploration of that in, in Phil Romero's paper. So with that, I'll uh, stop sharing and uh, open it up to questions. Well, first of all, let's thank Dr. Arnold. Thank you so much for a beautiful talk. We ha do we have some questions from the audience? Uh, Tom Knight's coming up to ask a question on, on the mic. I, I can't hear the question. I mean, maybe you can repeat it. Yes, he, he's, uh, Tom is going to repeat it. <laughs> Thank you. That was a, a marvelous presentation. The, uh, the question I had was, what role do you think we have in terms of culture collections and uh, 
access to sequence data from a wide variety of environmental sources. I noted that your uh, one of your seed proteins came from Iceland, uh, you know, and uh, I'm wondering whether uh, e whether we are adequately valuing the access we have or don't have, rather, to uh, the diversity that is out there in the natural world. Oh, Tom, that's a a long debate, right? Uh, I always thought, oh, you know, we could just evolve what we want or now use generative AI to make what we want. Uh, but I rely on that diversity for starting points. Um, so until we can generate that diversity for starting points, we should value that diversity because that's where the solutions will come from. And you often don't know. You just have to try them and see what works. But I'm, I'm not involved in you know, that aspect of things. So I'm not the right person to ask. Since I have your attention, I have another question I'd like to ask you. Uh, very much uh, curious about your view of some of the molecular dynamics simulations, uh, Schrodinger and uh, Anton, for example, what role that may play in our protein evolution? Well, I work with enzymes and I have found molecular dynamics to be singularly useless. <laughs> um, it, it only, so I haven't collaborated with Schrodinger and maybe they're much better than everybody else I've collaborated with, but I've only gotten weak explanations after the fact. And why is that? Because the mutations that I find that affect the chemistry, first of all, the effects are very small. They're accumulated over many generations, but each mutation might have a twofold increase, which is a fraction of a K caliper mole. No. And they, and they lie 30 angstroms from the active side of the enzyme. Not even the best molecular dynamics people have been able to explain how that happens, much less predict them a priori. So this is 30 years of experience, Tom, and I've been unhappy with it. So I'm challenging my audience to predict where I should make mutations in order to improve the activity of this silicon carbon bond forming, new silicon uh, carbon bond forming enzyme. And why do I want them to predict where those mutations should lie? Because it's really hard to screen. And the, and the screens are really my bottleneck. So any, any, uh, any improvement I can get from computation, I'm willing to try it. Right now, it's machine learning. I don't want to monopolize <laughs> I do have another question, which is, you know, what's what is the right number of uh, of you know tests per round of your uh, evolution? Uh, you know, are are we doing you know ten mutations per round? Are we doing a thousand? Uh, you know, what would happen if it were a hundred thousand? Uh, you know, how, how do you think this scales with the our ability to do things rapidly in cloud labs? So it's always a trade-off, right? Time versus how many generations versus how many screens per generation. And it all depends on the cost and time of the screen, right? If the screen is very, very expensive, then you have to find ways to minimize the number of samples that you take. If samples are free, then you can you know, waste your, <laughs> you can take as many samples as you want and maybe have fewer generations. Uh, and those are all different for every project. But the nice thing about the machine learning is that you can get more bang for your buck. And that's what everybody wants. They want to do more screens. They want to make more mutations. Uh, but machine learning can, can get to the same place and probably much more efficiently than just making the experimentation faster. I typically do 1,000 per generation. That's not a big number. But the screens are information rich, and they tell me what I really want to know. Thank you, Dr. Arnold, and thank you, Tom, for the questions. We have a lineup of questions for you here. <laughs> Hi there. Good morning, Dr. Arnold. I'm Nick Anderson, and I have just a uh, question on, um, or more of a remark. Um, 
on your beliefs on like when AI is capable of speaking DNA better than we can, because I know if I go into blast, start with methionine and then throw in a bunch of random codons, I get nothing. Once AI can get something, how do you foresee that we can generate new proteins um, that we can use in a therapeutic setting? And do you foresee this directed evolution that we're causing to be seen in a possibly negative light if we start implementing it in humans, would that become something more of like a eugenic standpoint? Just want to know your take. Okay. Well, the first one is that, that AI is already generating uh, therapeutic proteins. Um, it's remarkably capable uh, for proteins we understand reasonably well, like antibodies. Uh, and it's also able to, I mean, I'm talking generative AI, it's able to make some enzymes that look like enzymes we already know. It's able to make antibodies and a number of other proteins. So I think that's well on its way. And, and I think that's great because now we're no longer, you know, we can uh, do multiple optimizations using AI at the same time. We can design sequences that have multiple properties that are important for therapeutics. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that generative AI uh, will be helpful there. And machine learning for optimization, right? So, you know, you use directed evolution to optimize all those therapeutic antibodies anyway. So why not use machine learning in there? Um, the second question, I, I want you to repeat that because I'm not sure I fully grasp what you are interested in. So my concern was if we go too far, so to speak, with the um, directed enzyme evolution and implement it in humans, I was just wondering how um, we can tread the line between therapeutic and then eugenics if it becomes integrated within a person's DNA. So that was... <laughs> so I, I've never made anything that I would integrate into a person's DNA, but that doesn't mean somebody won't consider doing that. Um, if you wanna make carbon silicon bonds, <laughs> you, know, you could make your, I had a Twitter response to my paper said, oh gosh, can we make our own breast implants now? <laughs> you know, but that, that, that's the science fiction. Um, you know, our ability to write DNA is going to increase, right? That's the whole goal. For me, the, the benefits far outweigh the risks, but that's what this workshop is about. How do you intervene uh, at the point where those risks become real and we don't stop the benefits? Because honestly, if we don't come up with some you know, bio-type bio ways to do chemistry, we're, we're gonna be you know, floating in pools of toxic wastes and we don't want that. Great. Um, thank you. We have a question, a couple of questions from online. So I just want to ask one of them here. In a fully automated directed evolution cycle, has your lab experienced any instance where implicit knowledge gained over several decades in your lab wasn't captured in the process? <laughs> That's called graduate students. <laughs> I mean, I don't fully automate anything that I was talking at the end about Phil Romero's work. He's a former group member from my lab, who's now a professor at the University of Wisconsin. And that's been his dream to do that ever since he started um, doing machine learning work in my lab 10, 12 years ago. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I showed that just to show where the field is likely to be going. Um, but all the time you lose implicit knowledge. Graduate students come and go and nobody remembers what we did 15 years ago. And that's my job, but I'm not around very often. <laughs> so that, that happens. Um, you know, humans in the loop are very good, but humans are expensive and they're going to become more expensive. And when I say expensive, they've got better things to do than to pipette a thousand samples and, and you know, their, their, their eyes see certain patterns. But I think that the machine learning sees patterns that humans miss, right? So there's pluses and minuses. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. There's another question from the audience. Hi, I'm Wendy. I'm um, interested in national security and economic security. So I wanted to take us back to the mitigating risk section, leveraging opportunities, mitigating risk 
but big strategic risks. So if an adversary is using the same beautiful capability, but for deliberately engineering harm, can you point us to some things that the national security, economic security community should focus on in the next like five years to kind of understand where or how somebody who's witting and capable or a government that's witting and capable might target the United States or, or leverage it to, to gain strategic advantage um, in ways that we haven't had to think about to date because this is also new. So what would some, some priority areas to think about be? How would you bound that space? Well, first of all, I think the strategic advantage will be in, will be in who gets to ex exploit, to use the power of biology to do good things for the economy. Um, that's the biggest strategic advantage is not to be left behind in this, um, in this de technology development, because there's so many things that we could do far better than we're doing now. Uh, that said, you know, in the security space, find out who's building labs like this and see if you can <laughs> follow what they're doing. And, um, you know, it, I, it's unfortunately one of those technologies, it's, it's expensive now. It's very expensive to build a fully automated lab. Right? You can talk to your Emerald Labs friend about that, and I'm sure you do. But uh, it, 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 and it's, they're still not fully automated. So humans are in the, in most of the loops there. Um, but, uh, you know, finding, I think people talked about, you know, intervening when you move to the physical world, right? When you make sequences, can you identify what those sequences are doing? And DNA gets out, you know, DNA is pretty easy to, to test. <laughs> it has a tendency of getting out in air and everything else. <laughs> Yeah, quick follow up on that point. So what capability should the state and local officials have to understand what types of constructs are being released in their own environments? Yeah, you know, I think this also was discussed a little bit yesterday and has been discussed in various circles as having, you know, some understanding of, of problematic sequences. But I'll just point out, nature does a really good job at making dangerous things. And I've always wondered, you know, what, you know, we've got, there's smallpox out there, there's COVID, there's all sorts of pathogens that are terrifying that were made by nature, not by us. And, and what are the additional things that humans can do? Um, you know, I don't think it's so much in the DNA sequences, although that may be a problem. It's more in the weaponization of it. Thank you. There's a question from Dipti. Uh, hi, Dr. Arnold. I'm, I'm Deepti Tanjur. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. So I'm uh, generally wondering, um, laws of physics work are true beyond Earth. Do you think we have enough diversity, biodiversity, or the number of uh, different uh, biological activities we have on Earth? Will, if we understand it all very well and we go outside Earth and see biological activity, can we apply what we learn here? How, how much confidence can we have um, that what works on Earth will also work elsewhere? Oh, that are you talking about that life we find elsewhere would have the same principles? Or if we want to terraform Mars, would it work on Mars? I, I'm sorry, I don't fully understand your question. The former. Uh, okay. Like, would, would those principles translate to outside Earth, or are, are they, if we go outside Earth and see biological activity, can we explain them with what we currently uh, use? Well, for? we only know one form of life, right? Yeah, that's the only form we know. That doesn't mean there aren't other forms out there. So I, I'm all for understanding life on Earth, but I don't think that absolutely sets a boundary on what other life might look like. We have to be open-minded. It's not my expertise. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question from Tessa. Hey, Tessa Alexanian from IDIS. Thanks so much for your talk, Dr. Arnold. Uh, this workshop, we're 
you know, in the title, we've got both opportunities and risks. So I'm maybe going to ask you a double question about that. Under opportunities, you mentioned that the screens are your main bottleneck. Do you see, we're going to talk later today about a grand challenge. Are there grand challenges in that space? Is it collecting data sets so more stuff can be done in the ML space? Is it designing new assays so screens can be more efficient? It's designing new sampling procedures. So I'm, I'm sort of curious if you were- All the above. <laughs> <laughs> All the things, I'd love to have better data. I think that we're very data poor right now in protein engineering. Uh, there's no central database. I think Microsoft Research is trying to do that. One of my former students is trying to start something like that, but it's a long, we're a long ways from having a, a really uh, you know, powerful database for protein engineering, for machine learning. So that, that's something I would really like. And of course, the the screening challenge is super hard because every screen is different and there is no one size fits all. No matter how hard people try to do that, it just doesn't work. You've got to, the first law of directed evolution is you get what you screen for, which means you better screen for what you want. <laughs> and and that's that's tough, you know, because a lot of people say, well, I want to cure cancer. And how do you screen for that? You know, that's that's been a long, long standing challenge. And, and you think sort of inherently, for example, protein function just has to be a thousand different screens because you want a thousand different functions or? Well, I, I, I'd win another Nobel prize if I could figure out how to get beyond that. And I, I, I hope that somebody can figure that out, but they're, all the ones, the generic screens that I hear about don't give you what you're really interested in. They jury rig something that, um, that no longer reflects what really matters. So, you know, I, that's why I just do the hard analytical chemistry and develop screens for every problem. Right. So maybe the grand challenge is just, you know, not a thousand molecules, but a thousand screens. Uh, and then switching over to the risks question, I was curious if, you know, we, we talked a little bit yesterday about red lines. Are there any things you think we shouldn't design screens for, or we, sh we shouldn't run directed evolution uh, towards a target? Yeah. Yeah, gain of function in, in pandemics. I mean, pen, it, agents of pandemic, you know, problems. We should. I don't think we should be doing that. Very clear answer. Thank you. <laughs> There's another question from the chat. Could you please comment on how you've gone from evolving the technical expertise needed in your lab with collaborators as new tools and new methods change how you approach your work? How have these new tools changed how we should approach training the next generation of scientists? Well, as an engineer, I've been at the forefront of creating new tools and using new tools. So, and, and we're just a bunch of geeks in the lab. So we love that sort of thing. Uh, and machine learning is one of those new tools. And that's, I have to say that's been in, that's been driven by the young people. It's not me driving that. I'm I'm very receptive, but um, they're the ones that have to go and learn all this stuff and get computer scientists to collaborate with us. And so I, I don't see uh, I, I see them having a better vision than the older folks on what really the future is going to look like. Thank you. There's a question from Kavita Berger about, through the use of AI to predict novel structures and functions of proteins, have you identified any rules of life or other principles that could hold true across living systems? You know what holds true across living systems? Evolution works really well. Evolution solves a whole lot of problems for life. It may not solve problems for human beings, but life will go on and evolution is a tremendously innovative process. You shared beautifully how AI and machine learning is being used to help design and engineer new chemistry. Where are you most excited about the potential for AI and biomedical and biochemical applications? And then kind of to that, where are you most concerned? Well, this kind of goes back to previous questions. I'm excited that that we'll be able to combine generative AI and machine learning optimization to make all sorts of new molecular machines and you know molecular chemistry. Um, that said, then the op the bottleneck is 
is scaling up and, and implementing these kinds of processes. I can make all sorts of crazy enzymes, but if people don't use them, right? And if we don't have structures that allow for the scale up and changing out, you know, the chemicals industry, for example, then, you know, it just is a science paper and it's a lot of fun, but it won't have the impact. So we need a lot of, you know, deep thinking in our current industries on how we will retool those to use biology. Those are the, the big bottlenecks. But on the technology side, I think the next five years will demonstrate some really remarkable new abilities to, to compose DNA. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. There's a question from Adi. Hi, um, my name is Victoria. I'm a fellow with BLS here at the National Academies. And I have a question. Um, I know you're an enzyme person and enzymes are great, um, but proteins can have a variety of functions that are non-enzymatic. And so I was wondering if this kind of, you're familiar with this directed evolution approach being applied to other protein functions. For example, if we have a structural or scaffolding protein, like can we evolve it to be stronger using this same approach? Obviously you still have the screening issue, but um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's long as you've got a screen and you can produce the protein, right? Um, and people are using cell-free systems even. As long as you've got the screen, evolution is a fabulous uh, capability. Machine learning guided evolution can get you down to the low end regime, right? Where you have a lot less data, especially if you've got additional data, you know, that you can kind of incorporate into the models. Uh, but yes, people have used it for materials properties, uh, for channel redoptions, for, you know, therapeutic proteins like antibodies. Uh, I mean, basically anything that a protein does it, it may be evolvable. It may not, you know, you may not get what you want, right? Because there may not be a sequence nearby that gives you that. But but I'm, I'm quite convinced that there are a lot of proteins out there that are going to be extremely useful to us. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, hi, uh, Justin Overcash, Biotechnology Regulatory Services. So my question might not have an answer, but I'm curious, this is something we debate in the office all the time. Um, where would you, or do you have any thoughts on where you would draw a line between a modified protein and a synthetic protein, if you would draw a line at all? I don't know what synthetic protein means. You well, mean something that wasn't derived from the biological world? Right. But still is a protein. Right, so we have, right, I think, um, right, synthetic biology, um, we kind of, right, we see modified proteins, wild type proteins, chimeric proteins. And one of the questions we have because, right, synthetic biology is on the horizon, you have regulatory groups starting to talk about it. Where do we draw the line between something that's been modified to the point where maybe it could be considered synthetic because it's different enough? But I don't understand. Is that for IP purposes? To me, those distinctions don't make any sense, mm. right? Unless it's for a legal battle. But, you know, a protein is a protein. Um, right. So maybe a continuum. Well, yeah, I know. I think in the regulatory sphere, there is right when we talk about genetically modified versus something that's truly synthetic biology. I think maybe I would draw the line in in that you're right. If you start you use machine learning and you come up with a protein that isn't based off something you find in nature, that's probably how I would define it. I was just curious about your thoughts on it. Yeah. But but I don't understand. I think the regulatory definitions may not make sense, right, in this new world where we're going to create all sorts of proteins and you may not know <laughs> where they where they come from. I could have scraped it off the bottom of my shoe or I could have made it through synthetic biology. Doesn't isn't it the function and the effect that matters? Sure. Yeah. No, I, I tend to agree. I was just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. Uh, Stephen Moss, you have a question? Um, hi, Dr. Arnold, uh, Stephen Moss. I'm at the Biotech's National Security Commission. Um, 
I have a question. So related to your presentation, you you talked a lot about kind of these big challenges that you wanted to solve with biology. So creating carbon silicon bonds, breaking down some of those bonds. So I'm wondering, what are you thinking about in terms of the next big challenge that you would like to solve with biology or that your lab would like to solve with biology? So I, my lab is, uh, we, we're focused on opening people's minds. Uh, we do pretty basic research in this evolutionary space, right, to show what biology can do. Uh, so I have a number of challenges, you know, things that are people tell me is impossible to do that I'd love to do. But the whole the whole goal is to empower others to use these methods. That's I, that's why I never patented the you know the basic methods. Um, you. I want to empower people to use them and use, you know, the creativity of thousands of minds to go out there and develop the chemistry so that biology can encode all this chemistry. So I think the great challenge is to freeze free people's way of thinking about biology and what biology can do. And then the big challenge, of course, is implementing it, right? When you've made something, how do you actually get it out into the world in a way? This is not trivial by any means. I start companies and, you know, it's really hard to make jet fuel from, from carbon dioxide. It's super hard and it's really expensive and it's very, very hard to compete with pumping oil out of the ground. So that's what I think the big challenge is, is actually implementing these things at scale. Great, thank you. Andrew Grummer has a question. Thanks, Dr. Arnold. So my question actually, I think, is a, is a good follow on to what Stephen just asked, uh, because one of the things we're considering at this workshop and talking about are what are specific measurable targets almost that we can use to really easily both measure our progress as well as kind of communicate out to kind of a general public and audience to really measure our progress, understand how we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, and we think back to kind of these grand challenges throughout history, landing on the moon, um, sequencing the human genome. There's very easy targets for us to know whether or not we've been successful. And I just wanted to know if you had any comments or thoughts on what we can use as those targets for this intersection of AI, automation, biology, enzyme engineering. What are the targets in that vast space that you you talked about in kind of the realm of possibility that we could use to kind of communicate our aspirations in this? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. To To create an enzyme that doesn't exist today that Francis Arnold has not been able to make, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that we can't find a starting activity for that's my limitation. And if I don't find that promiscuous activity out in nature, I've got nothing to do, right. I can wait until more enzymes come my way to test, but I think, you know, a grand challenge really is to create enzymes from scratch. And I know David Baker has been trying to do that for 25 years, as have many other people. It's really hard to make enzymes. And I'm saying not just trivial enzymes, you know, with a single transition state, but real enzymes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Arnold. We have a question from Catherine Cabrera. Okay. Um, hi, this is uh, Catherine Cabrera from Lincoln Lab. Thank you for a spectacular presentation. I just was so happy to hear you speak. My question is about proteins, which evolved, of course, to be in bacteria and microbes in a certain environment. As you're doing your screening in your laboratory, how much do you focus on recapitulating what you think that microenvironment was that the protein evolved into? And to what extent do you try to deliberately modulate that environment to try to elicit novel or modify the capabilities of the protein that you're tweaking? Thank you. So the question is, do I change the environment, you know, for expression or screening? For right? screening, the, for the question is for the screening. Do you try to emulate what the protein would have been experiencing in its native? No, state? <laughs> I'm not interested in what it would be experiencing. If I'm making an enzyme for a laundry detergent, I'm interested in emulating what it's like in your laundry machine, right? So um, that th th it's really important to train it to adapt to a new environment. <clears throat> So it might be a chemical process for making a drug or, a, you know, to be sit on the shelf for two years as a reagent for DNA sequencing or, you know, whatever it is. So, yeah, I'm not interested in 
what it experienced during its evolutionary life. I mean, interested in what it's going to experience during its future evolution. Thank you so much, Dr. Arnold. If there are any other questions from the audience, I think there is one. Morning, Dr. Arnold. You mentioned a few things about um, ranging from basic research to um, implementation and for lack of a better term, marketing. This is a little different question, but we're talking about um, a convergence of AI and biotech and, and actually it's multidisciplinary as an approach. My question is, is our educational systems, particularly in universities, is it set up properly to really take advantage of developing the next generation of workforce to be able to capitalize on this? And if not, what are some of your recommendations to make that happen? Well, that's a really good question. That's something we deal with a lot in PCAST. Um, you know, our, our ability to, to have the appropriately trained workforce is, is not good. Um, biomanufacturing, <laughs> we let it all go, right? Very few people understand how to scale up processes and do biomanufacturing. Semiconductors, we don't have the appropriate workforce. So they, we have to invest in, in training. Who's going to do that? Oh, it, it's it's uh, it's an important thing. So universities are trying, right? But often they don't know, and they can't hire enough faculty in in these areas who have that kind of experience. The technology moves a lot faster than academics does. That's for sure. Another question from DT. Uh, uh, Dr. Arnold, it's probably a follow up to the question, the previous question. So when you travel across the world and you visit various labs, what do you see that uh, these other countries are probably doing right and we're missing out maybe around workforce development, uh, especially when they're training their graduate students or so? Is there something that the U.S. has to focus on that we're missing out on? Well, I think we do a pretty good job at the graduate student level. I'm talking more about in manufacturing uh, when I answered before, graduates, you know, we're we're pretty innovative when it comes to exploring new areas and 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 training. And of course, everybody is going into AI now, so there probably will be a glut in the workforce in five years. But but um, you know, we're graduate level. I'm I'm pretty confident that we can do. One problem, of course, is that the that we're paying our graduate students a lot more now. That's great for them, but it's not good for the overall enterprise. So I think we can count on having fewer PhDs coming out of these programs in the coming years because the budgets aren't going up. So it's pretty simple math. Um, that means it's ever even more important to have uh, your experiments mean more and to get more experiments out, uh, you know, per person. So these automated systems are going to become even more important, I think. Thank you. A question about uh, the, your work with AlphaFold and understanding that, identifying that it didn't provide details on mutations. Did you have to identify that experimentally? Or do you think in the future, knowing the limitations and constraints of AI programs would be done by AI itself? I don't think we'll replace the actual screening data. So the point was that that um, AlphaFold cannot evaluate mutations. That, that That's known, right? Especially if you're going after non-natural functions. AlphaFold just doesn't have those data. It has lots of evolutionary data for, you know, for functions that exist. But I, I, I see it... Um, important for other applications, but not for evaluating or predicting or modeling mutations. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, you have a, a, a couple of questions from the chat. Um, inspiring talk, you have emphasized the value of looking at a problem through a different lens and the engineer's approach to solving biomedical problems or biological problems. Are there any other fields currently that aren't collaborating or talking with each other that you think should be? Hmm. A lot, right? Um, I think my view as an engineer coming into a field that was dominated by structural biologists was exactly the kind of disruption that it needed. And that's very often the case that we get siloed into looking at a problem from one set of eyes. You know, chemistry is like that. And we think that 
you know, only chemists can understand chemistry. Well, sometimes an engineer comes in and it peed, it it teed off the chemist big time when an engineer won the Nobel Prize. But you know, this is what happens. And we have to, you know, we you know, we have to welcome those different perspectives sometimes. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. And Kavita Berger has a question. What do you think are the most significant limitations in using AI in protein design? Uh, data. That's the most significant limitation. Data and then, you know, testing. But um, the data, having the data to build models from, uh, we just don't have it in proper format. We don't have enough of it. Well, thank you, Dr. Arnold, so much for your time this morning and for answering all the many questions. <laughs> Byron. Thanks to everyone and have a great rest of the day. I'm going to be listening in. Thank you. Okay. Now we have a sh short break, please. Rand is uh, going to take the stage <laughs> and um, go ahead, please. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. My name is Greg McElvey. I'm a senior physician researcher from RAND. Uh, for those who don't know, RAND is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization that supports policymaking through analysis. Uh, so I've been given the impossible task of following Dr. Arnold's fantastic talk, uh, but thankfully I don't have to do that alone. Uh, we have a tremendous uh, panel coming up that's gonna help us with one of the biggest challenges that I think we identified uh, throughout this workshop, but especially yesterday. And it's the theme that technology, as we know, is moving very fast, and it has a continued uh, capacity to surprise us. And in, in scientific context, that can be amazing. Serendipity is often the source of many of our greatest breakthroughs. But from a national security context where I live, uh, surprise uh, from technology, especially when it's strategic, is unwelcome. And so for the next hour, we're going to spend uh, our time trying to think through how we could better anticipate the progress of technology, including by using technology itself uh, to achieve better prognostication. So uh, we have three goals for this session. We'll explore forecasting methodologies and some case studies of uh, uh, understanding technology's trends and where it's going. We'll look at specifically the trends at the convergence of artificial intelligence, automation, and the life sciences, and ways that those technologies themselves can actually help us better anticipate future progress. And finally, we'll talk about ways that we might identify gaps that are holding us back from the futures that we so desperately want. Uh, so please, uh, I will welcome the first guest, uh, Tame Bessaroglu, is the founder, co-founder, and associate director of Epoch AI and a research affiliate in MIT CSAIL Lab, uh, and he's going to uh, open us up here. Tamai. Hey, thanks so much. All right, uh, great. Well, it's great to be here. So I'm Tamai, I'm the Associate Director of Epoch. I'm uh, a uh, researcher at the Computer Science and AI Lab at MIT. Uh, unlike many of you, I'm not a biologist, so uh, please bear with me. Um, so Epoch is an organization that I co-founded where we try to bring transparency into the process of uh, building uh, kind of frontier AI systems for uh, government for uh, benefit of civil society and so on. Um, so today I'm going to talk about trends in compute and data for biological sequence models. Um, and this is based on some work uh, by, by, uh, by collaborators. So a quick overview, I'm going to talk about um, uh, trends in compute and AI broadly and specifically in biological sequence models. Then uh, I will discuss the relationship between performance and the uh, computational, computational resources, resources that are used to train these models um, and what, what this tells us about the extent to which progress in uh, biological sequence modeling is predictable um, and then talk about whether there's enough data and what type of uh, data exists to train and scale up uh, these models. Um, I'm going to try to make the case that the performance of these biological sequence models uh, is likely uh, to continue improving as we scale up the amount of compute 
and, and data that's used to train these. And uh, this is uh, fairly predictable. Um, so just picking a broad kind of zoomed out view of the field of AI um, since its inception, here we have a graph that shows uh, the amount of compute that is used to train AI systems since the start, since the inception of the field in uh, the 1950s. And so initially, uh, from the 1950s to uh, about 2010, we see, um, so by the way, on the, on the Y axis here, we have the amount of compute used to train these systems in operations and floating point operations as well. And these increments uh, increase by a factor of 10,000 fold. And so it's a really vast range of amount of compute that is used to train these models. And on the x-axis, we have the day. And so um, from the 1950s to about 2010, we see uh, a rate of increase of compute used to train them that amounts to a doubling roughly of every kind of 20, 21 months, which is roughly the rate at which the chips that are used to train, that, that are used for the computers have been improving. And then something interesting happens around 2010, which is the advent of uh, deep learning. And since 2010, we've seen an acceleration in the amount of compute used to train machine learning models. And now the amount of compute used in training is doubling every six months. And this is because people, labs are you know, deploying more and more uh, you know, larger and larger uh, compute clusters and GPUs to train these systems. Another way to think about this is that what previously took 60 years to achieve uh, a, a 10 million fold increase in the amount of compute used to train these systems recently took us just over a dozen years. And so we've kind of been running through kind of many multiples of compute used in training recently. And I think this is really a key fact about um, you know, why uh, AI has seen such exciting progress in the recent decade. It's precisely because of this acceleration in the amount of compute and then the development of techniques that enable us to leverage this compute productively. So there's some work um, done by myself and some, some collaborators on the uh, importance of compute for explaining you know, the performance gains in key domains like uh, computer vision uh, and language modeling. So a recent paper uh, of mine and some collaborators to show that maybe about two thirds of performance improvements in language models, so things like GPT models, um, is the result of just scaling the amount of compute that is used in training, with the remainder being performance uh, improvements in the training techniques and the algorithms that kind of underpin these models. So compute is really a kind of a very important part to explaining why we see such progress in, in AI broadly. But what about for um, biological sequence models? Well, there we see kind of a similar picture. Obviously, we have less data to go on because it's a fairly recent uh, field. Uh, but here we see uh, even faster rate of scaling of the amount of computation used in training, especially for the frontier systems. Um, so some work by myself and some, some collaborators show that we see a doubling every four months. And so that's a factor of eight every year of the amount of compute used to train these systems. So for instance, if we compare AlphaFold 2 with, um, with a, a recent 100 billion parameter protein language models, protein language model, we see a 200-fold increase in the amount of computation used to train. Um, and, and this is over a span of, uh, of just over two years. And if you can compare that to, say, GPT-3 to GPT-4, which is spaced out roughly the same interval in time, that was only a 50x increase. Whereas for biological uh, sequence models, we see potentially larger increases in, in computers over the same time frame. And by the way, the blue region here is the, um, is the, is the region that uh, is the amount of com computation that uh, uh, kind of uh, puts you in, in, in the threshold for these heightened reporting requirements as part of the executive order uh, in uh, you know from from October 2023? And there's currently one model. This is this this hundred billion parameter protein language model that, that kind of qualifies to, to these uh, or is subject to these heightened uh, reporting requirements. Um, but I expect that over the next couple of years, we'll have many more models that 
and it will need to, will breach this threshold of, of 10 to the 23 operations. Um, great. So we see this kind of very rapid scaling. Now, a key question is, is it the case in biological sequence modeling that just scaling up the amount of compute and data used in training kind of improves performance? And I think the evidence is, is still fairly um, preliminary, but there is kind of some strong signs in this direction. So this is some data from um, this paper, uh, which is the same paper that introduced that 100 billion parameter model where they did a bunch of these scaling experiments. And, and they show um, across four different tasks, protein structure prediction, function prediction, interaction and developability prediction. Um, they show that a doubling in the compute used to train these, these models uh, very predictably and reliably kind of Bring, um, gives you these linear increases in the performance. And so on the y-axis here, we see the level of performance in some notion of accuracy. On the x-axis, we have the amount of compute used in training. And what you see is kind of a pretty good fit in, in many cases. And so this, this tells you that a large fraction of the variation in performance is just purely explained in terms of uh, you know, the amount of compute and data used to train these, these, these models. And so I think just like in other domains of machine learning that I've done work in, such as language models and computer vision, I suspect that for, um, for biological sequence models, at least for some tasks, it's going to be the case that you get these predictable improvements in performance uh, from just scaling up the uh, kind of computation used to train these models. Um, so a very important question is whether there's enough data, and this is something that Dr. Arnold also discussed, uh, whether there's enough data and whether this is in the right formats and so on to be able to um, uh, kind of enable us to train kind of this, this next generation of model each time that is larger than the previous. And so what we um, have, have been looking at, into is kind of what is the ecosystem of databases for biological sequences, for DNA sequences, protein sequences, protein structures. And, and so this is kind of the picture that we end up with. So here we see the number of unique entries across many, many different publicly available um, biological sequence databases. And you know, starting around the mid 1970s, we see kind of this growth in the number of entries in these, in these key databases. Um, this is a logarithmic scale. So it's slightly sub exponential growth, but still very rapid. Um, and in about around the kind of mid 2000s, we see a bunch of new databases being introduced. And recently we've seen really rapid growth from uh, metagenomic databases, as well as uh, structured databases. Uh, when some of these models have, uh, some of these models like AlphaFold have been able to generate like very high quality data so that we've seen, you know, AlphaFold, DB, and ESM um, Atlas and other, other kind of synthetically generated, these uh, kind of AI generated databases uh, kind of come online and, and provide a lot of uh, additional structured data. So the kind of, the, the, the kind of very steep blue dashed line is for instance, I think uh, uh, that's the AlphaFold database that kind of gives us a, a bunch more uh, protein structure data to potentially train on. Um, so if we kind of do an accounting and, and look at how much kind of unique sequences there are across, uh, at least for protein sequences, we estimate that there might be on the order of, of about 7 billion kind of unique entries across some of these key databases. And um, to, to kind of put this into context, the largest protein language model that has been trained so far was trained on about 1 billion uh, protein uh, sequences. Um, and so there's, there's certainly this factor of seven, at least, of additional kind of data scaling that what could do with just publicly available protein sequence data. Um, then there are other things that one could do to get more value out of this data, such as training for multiple epochs, which is a, a technique that people in language modeling are starting to of do in order to overcome some of the data bottlenecks that they're encountering there. And it, it might be the case that that also works here, uh, given that the architectures are essentially the same that people are using in, you know, for these pro protein language models and the 
kind of language models that people are, are training like GPT-4 and so on. Um, and, and then there's kind of rapid progress in recent years for DNA sequences and, and metagenomic data in the you know, 20 to 30% per year rates. And so not only is the stock quite large, but it's also uh, growing pretty rapidly. And so this is likely to enable us to kind of train at least for the next two to five years to continue scaling at rates that we've seen historically. Um, so, sure. yeah. Uh, so yeah, just, just brief, briefly wrapping up. Uh, so biological sequence models have been scaling up very quickly. Uh, the amount of compute used to train them has doubled roughly every four months. It seems very likely that at least for some tasks, for some models, the performance is very tightly linked to the amount of compute and data that's used in training. And so this means that performance improvements are likely to be somewhat predictable given that it, it, is, it, it is somewhat predictable how much compute people will be use it, using to train this absent kind of stringent regulation about how much compute you can use. Um, and I think the stock of sequence data is also quite large and growing really rapidly and like sufficient to sustain kind of the next couple generations of models. All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Right. We, we have time for maybe one question for Tamai uh, before we transition to our next speaker. So, well, I'll, I'll take the speaker's prerogative here. Tamai, thank you so much. Uh, maybe a question for you. Uh, you. You sort of drew a parallel between the progress in biologically uh, trained models and sort of natural language trained models. Uh, it, can you speak to sort of the the size comparison between the two, sort of what, yeah. what is the size that we're currently seeing in biology? What is it analogous to in the size of natural language models? Yeah, so there's a sizable gap between these models. So the largest um, protein language model is, it was trained using about uh, 3E23 uh, floating point operations. So that's three times 10 to the power of 23 floating point operations. That's about a hundred fold uh, smaller than models like GPT-4 that power the at least the paid version of chat GPT. Um, and, and then there's like Gemini and other models that we suspect are even larger than that. So there, there is this sizable gap. Um, and, 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 you know, that's kind of understandable because these models like chat GPT are actually generating, you know, a hundred, you know millions of dollars of revenue for, for these companies. Whereas for kind of biological sequence models, it, it hasn't quite been de-risked to that level where companies might be willing to invest a whole lot in this. Now, I think it's probably going to be a good idea to train these very large models if you, um, you know, look at some of these trends and see, you know, maybe we could get a lot of economic value out of them. And so I, I suspect this, uh, this kind of gap of a hundredfold will be bridged in, in the next couple of years unless you have like stringent regulation that makes it really difficult to train very large biological sequence models. Um, so, you know, the, the executive order has some of these reporting requirements and it's kind of to be determined what those might do to and, and how um, much they will uh, create reluctance to actually, you know, push into the unknowns. But I suspect people will um, will, will train these, these large models that are of the scale of GPT-4. Thank you. So we have room to grow, it sounds yeah. like. All right, well, join me at the table here and we'll uh, virtually get our next speaker up. Thank you. All right, uh, let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, Erica Alden de Benedictus is joining us virtually from the Francis Crick Institute where she is a group leader. She's also the founder of the nonprofit Align to Innovate. Uh, I'll turn it over to Erica. Hello. Um... Yeah, so I'm Erica, um, and a few years ago, I started a nonprofit that is um, aiming to address the fact that we don't have enough data to take advantage of all of the machine learning um, that we now have. And um, my background is actually in physics, so I, I was originally trained in astronomy, um, and that is a discipline where predictive models work really well. And so when um, when AlphaFold came out and sort of 
I would argue became the first non-trivial predictive model we have in life science that actually predicts what happens when you do an experiment. Um, this was really heartening. Um, this is a great sign that biology is growing up and becoming a discipline where we can actually make predictions. And if we want more of this and want biology to be like a robust engineering discipline, the ingredients for success, um, I would say, were these. Um, AlphaFold was enabled by a really well-defined problem. So the, the structural biology community had heralded uh, protein folding as a grand challenge in biology for 50 years um, before AlphaFold came along. Um, and that meant that there was an enormous amount of like benchmarking data and there was the CASP competition. There was like a lot of infrastructure in place to determine when the problem had been solved. Um, there was also finally a match between the capabilities of the machine learning models and like the underlying structure of the scientific problem that needed to be solved. And uh, most importantly, there was a huge data set lying around. So AlphaFold is backed by um, 50 years worth of the entire structural biology community's data that had been put in one place in a format that, that could be used. And to me, that's actually the hardest part. Um, and uh, if, we, if we back compute how much money went into creating the protein data bank that AlphaFold was trained on, you get a number in the tens of billions of dollars. Um, this was a enormous effort on the part of an enormous number of experimentalists to gather that much data. And so when we think about how to make more predictive models in life science, the question isn't how to make the next alpha fold, it's how to make the next protein data bank, the next big data set that backs these models. Um, and the, the magnitude of those data sets is more on par with large projects that we're familiar with in physics than it is with the normal way we mostly do life science of sort of individual PIs doing uh, experimentation like in a, in a, in a single lab. Um, in life science, we do have some history of doing large scale directed projects like the Human Genome Project. Um, the protein data bank we kind of did by accident, but was also a great idea. And we need more like concerted efforts to uh, tackle the need for large data sets um, if we want more successes like AlphaFold. Um, so a couple of years ago, I started this nonprofit called Align to Innovate, um, which is a organization that's aiming to improve the, the reproducibility, scale scalability and shareability of life science research. Um, this nonprofit was essentially <laughs> founded out of frustration with the fact that we actually do have a lot of, um, especially automation technology that could, in principle, help us um, gather large data sets, but largely um, those things don't really touch the lives of your average bench scientist. We mostly still do things by hand. And so I wanted to create an organization that um, experiments with new ways to incorporate automation um, in life science research. And um, we have a program called the Open Data Sets Initiative that is taking a stab at um, uh, uh, a, a new structure for what it would look like for biology as a field to coordinate on identifying big data sets we need and actually gathering them. And basically it works like this. Um, we spent most of last year um, talking to scientists and figuring out what data sets we want um, that would be both feasible to collect and really valuable if we had them. Um, then we take those concepts through a sort of maturation process and build them out into actionable proposals, um, then align partners with um, automation uh, partners to actually implement um, data collection methods. And the, the concept is that um, scientists all over the world could send in samples to be analyzed or request um, you know, data points to be added to the data set. Um, we would then hook them up with an automation partner to do that, and it gets added to a um, public data set after an embargo period. Um, and uh, the question, of course, is what data sets do we want? <laughs> so. Um, we talked to a lot of people and I, I think um, themes started emerging. Um, we are mostly focused on uh, data sets and prediction tasks in the protein arena because those feel like the most actionable right now, both, both the most feasible to collect from an automation standpoint um, and also 
uh, most feasible to model and predict from a machine learning standpoint. But um, there are many other sort of topic areas that might benefit from this approach as well. Um, and uh, to be more specific, um, Align is currently going after two, uh, two predictive models in particular. Um, one is to predict how well a protein will express when you attempt to express it in a specific microbe. Um, this is a huge problem, uh, practically speaking, for the industry. Um, many engineered proteins don't necessarily fold properly um, and don't necessarily express well. And uh, if you are engineering a protein, no matter how cool it is, if your cell can't make it, you're pretty dead in the water. Um, this is also an issue for scaling. So even if your protein does express a little, if it doesn't express fabulously well, you have basically no chance of being able to scale up production um, in a in a biomanufacturing context. So this was a um, this is a model that would have huge practical utility for the field. Um, uh, next is predicting function. So um, alpha fold predicted structure, which for a long time we sort of saw as a, an entry point to understanding what a protein actually does, which is what we care about. And the sort of next step is to more directly predict that, um, especially predicting the effect of, of point mutations on, on protein function, which is still quite hard. Um, so uh, the upside of generating data sets and predictive models is that we would then be able to use them as a field to make science easier and go faster. Um, the downsides uh, could be many. And so Align's approach to biosecurity is to, uh, on an ongoing basis, include people in thinking through what the potential risks might be um, and uh, incorporating that in like a rolling basis. These are these are going to be living data sets. And so um, it's not like a one and done thing to think about it ahead of time. Um, so basically we throughout the whole um, sort of ideation proposal implementation process loop in um, experts and we sort of prompt people at all stages to think about biosecurity risk. Um, we also, uh, at least for the protein data sets, um, a lot of the risk comes in which proteins are being measured um, and whether someone is asking you to synthesize a sequence of DNA that encodes something that might be um, uh, dangerous. And that is baked into a lot of DNA synthesis providers, um, which is nice because um, that's, a, that's a key vulnerability and there's sort of already some um, structure in place to take care of that of that risk. And the third thing is that um, uh, we're trying to make open data sets in the sense that we want these to be a public good that gets shared and used by the community. Um, however, we're not going to just upload it as a zip file to the internet. Um, this is a uh, data access will be for users who are known users um, and are authorized and they have to sign a, a data use agreement and, and things like that. Um, and that just, uh, places a little bit, it, we at least know who the users are, um, which um, which is is valuable from a security standpoint. Um, and that's all for me. Erica, thank you so much. Uh, fantastic talk. We have a question from online uh, on your biosecurity points. You mentioned access controls for the data and for nucleic acid synthesis. Uh, the question is, would it be possible to discourage the models themselves from generating harmful outcomes by training them with or without pathogenic sequences and or potential guidelines to prevent misuse? Yeah, uh, probably. Um, I mean, I, I think broadly, there's a lot of opportunity when more biology becomes automated to introduce um, like more specific safeguards. So as you say, like, suppose you do have a model for protein function and you're able to prompt that model to, um, perhaps you can prompt that model, model in natural language. You're like, hey, I would like to have a protein that catalyzes this reaction at room temperature in this organism. Please give me a sequence and it will spit out a sequence. Um, uh, for sure, it would be lovely if you could 
um, restrict that model from generating uh, sequences that have functions that are like on an on a don't design list of like pathogenic functions, for example. Um, and I think we're we're not there yet in the sense that um, the the risks, like the things that can feasibly do be done right now, is mostly synthesizing DNA. Um, and there's some known risks there, so that's what's to, what's what we need to protect against. Um, and I think the the dilemma is how you know making sure that as the models improve and what they can actually do, we in kind uh, continue to evaluate whether there's new ways to like specifically prevent them from doing doing bad stuff that's now possible. Um, so yeah, totally. And I, I think that's a that's a really interesting area for folks to work on as these models get better. Fantastic. Thank you. We have a question from the room. Uh, thanks, Erica, for the very talk. Uh, I'm curious why you picked the targets that you did in terms of data collection. For example, why did you not go after bioreactor uh, data? All those problems seem very relevant. Totally. I would love to have a predictive model of scale up. Um, so, uh, I mean, a huge issue for um, sort of circular economy and also just biomanufacturing as an industry is that when you <laughs> try to do biomanufacturing at, you know, 10 mil scale or 100 mil scale, it is not the same as when you scale up to big tanks. And that is an incredibly tough problem to gather data on because there is this asymmetry in how much it costs to gather data. At small scale, you can get a lot of it for cheap, at big, big scale, it costs enormous amounts of money, literally just in raw materials to get data. Um, so that is that is a model, like a predictive model of what happens when you scale up is something people would love to have, but I still don't know a um, cost feasible way to gather that data set. Um, so if you have ideas, I would love to talk about it actually. Um, that That would be invaluable. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have some ideas, but many more complaints than ideas about that topic. So. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more question in the room. Sure. Elliot Chekhov, I, I thought that was a great presentation. As you embrace this grand challenge in uh, protein data set collection, how are you dealing with the challenge of post-translational modifications as important determinants of function? both recognized and unrecognized. And I'm thinking in particular of glycosylation and the important role it plays in many pro protein functions. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think um, that is a very good point. And I think uh, the way you manufacture your protein matters in, in so many ways um, and like fundamentally the models we build are limited by the data collection modality that is used so for example um alpha fold um doesn't know <laughs> uh doesn't know how proteins are folded doesn't know their dynamics it knows what happens when you crystallize a protein in a crystallography experiment and that's a different thing right so it's able to predict the results of a specific experiment not like fundamentally understand like the protein when it's in a cell or in this environment or that environment, right? And so the the predictive models we make are going to be um, biased by what they've seen of the world, which is just the data we give them. And as you say, uh, glycosylation is incredibly important. And so if we want it to be included, we have to include um, either uh, ways to produce and measure protein function, like in mammalian cells where we care about them, or in uh, cell free that includes, uh, you know, the post translational modifications you care about. Um, and so, yeah, like when you get down to the specifics, you have to add a lot of data in order to capture the the um, effects you care about. Um, that said, um, lowest hanging fruit first, right? So I think if we we have like one predictive model in life science, let's get two. <laughs> and I'd like to go after the second model that is the easiest to collect data for, um, which isn't going to be the bioreactor scale-up model or uh, glycosylation. Um, let's do those third. 
right? So, so, so I'm just trying to like, I think, I think we need to, as a discipline, get better at collecting data sets before we tackle some of the ones that are really technically challenging to, to literally gather data on. Thank you. Hi, Eric, I thank you so much. Uh, I will bring on the next speaker. Uh, Ezra Carger is the research director at the Forecasting Research Institute, as well as an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Ezra, thank you so much. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so today I'm going to talk about work joint with Phil Tetlock, who's joining us remotely. And this is work so we started an organization, this Forecasting Research Institute, with about 20 full-time researchers and academic consultants and affiliates to try to understand how we can better use forecasting to identify capabilities and risks in the artificial intelligence space, the biological risk space, the nuclear risk space, as well as in the economic space, where I think a lot about uh, economic forecasting at the Federal Reserve. And I want to start by talking about some of the core challenges of forecasting in this space. Phil and collaborators for the past 10 years have been working on a research agenda that centers on this first generation of forecasting. This idea that we don't really know how well people can forecast. Uh, so let's ask people questions and let's see how accurate they are. Let's ask people questions that resolve over very short time spans. Let's bring in people who are normal people who are recruited online or who are recruited uh, you know, via Facebook. And let's ask questions where we can actually know who is accurate or not, because the likelihood of these events resolving is in this middle probability range, let's say the 10 to 90% range. And there was no real drive of this first set of forecasting elicitation experiments to focus on questions that were particularly policy or decision relevant. And so we started this organization to think about forecasting in the spaces that we're talking about today, artificial intelligence, bio-risk, we think that these questions are particularly challenging and interesting because we won't know who was correct. We won't have rigorous resolution for many decades or centuries. And we also think that the technical knowledge needed to answer questions in this space is not necessarily available to random people who we find online who are often the subjects of these experiments. We often need experts like the people in this room or online to tell us exactly what the key questions are and what the answers to those questions are when we're thinking about uh, biological progress, artificial intelligence, and other technical domains. Another problem with this space is we're thinking about events that are very important but might be very unlikely to happen. So if you think about risks from bioweapons or uh, nuclear weapon use, nuclear risk, even if the probability of some of these events happening is very small, one in a million, one in a billion, it might still be very policy relevant to focus on those issues. And we don't know a lot about the methods one should use to elicit forecasts in that probability space, in the low probability domains. And lastly, we're all here today to talk about some of these issues. So we think these are very policy relevant and decision relevant topics. So I want to start by pulling out, I'm going to talk about three of the projects that we're working on, two are complete and one's in progress. And this is work from a project where we elicited forecasts from experts and highly accurate forecasters about risks that humanity faces over the next century or so, so through 2100. And what we did is we asked domain experts, about 80 of them, across the nuclear risk, bio risk, and artificial intelligence spaces what they thought the probability was that by 2100, each of their domains of interest would cause the death of at least 10% of the world's population within a five-year period. We call this a catastrophe for the purposes of our, of our project. And what we can see is that the domain experts gave very high probabilities. Experts on artificial intelligence think there's roughly a 12% chance that this happens. Experts on biological risks think there is maybe a 3% chance that an engineered pathogen causes one of these catastrophes and around a 1% chance that a natural pathogen does. And across all catastrophes, we see roughly a 20% chance. Experts are giving a 20% chance that some catastrophe happens through any of these domains. Now, I think there are several questions you should have about this table. 
The first is why should we trust these forecasts, right? These are numbers where we're eliciting low probability forecasts from experts, and there's very little research in how to do this well. But it should at least tell us that there's something important about figuring out how to ask these questions and figuring out how to understand the mechanisms underlying why the experts are so concerned about these topics. And so what we did, and you can see this in the first column, is we brought in the best forecasters from some of Phil's earlier work. These are people who were originally recruited from all over the internet, who happened to be incredibly accurate on short run resolvable questions in that first generation of forecasting tournaments that I mentioned. And what you'll see, I wanna highlight two things. First, they're still very concerned about risks from these domains, but second, they are less concerned than the experts. And I find this very interesting because it implies that one of two things is happening. Either experts have knowledge that they are not persuading these highly accurate forecasters of, or experts are biased in their beliefs about risk relative to these highly accurate forecasters. I think those are the two most plausible things that could be going on. There are other things, obviously, that could be happening. We also, in this last column, did a survey of the public, which showed surprisingly similar results to, to the experts and the accurate forecasters. So this was from a project where we had experts and accurate forecasters, about 80 of each, work together in an online platform for several months trying to understand these issues. But they were very spread out across domains. They were talking about lots of questions at the same time. And we can see that there was a lot of disagreement. So this is just focusing on that total catastrophic risk question. And you can see, and I, I want to make a note here because I don't like presenting y-axes that are often skewed like this, but I'm doing this on purpose. I wanted to highlight the low probability forecast here. So this is more of an inverted log scale. And what you can see is that uh, in terms of total catastrophic risk, there were previously highly accurate forecasters who have forecasts around zero, like you know one in a million, one in 10,000. And there were also accurate forecasters who think the likelihood of a total of a catastrophic risk from any source is closer to 50%. Among experts, you see a huge range as well. You see experts who think the risk is you know, closer to zero and experts who think the risk is above 80%. And so what we see here and the reason we're pursuing a lot of research in this space is there does not seem to be consensus about the level of risks faced by humanity over the next century or the types of risk faced by humanity over the next century. And so I wanna talk about a second project and I'll just have one slide on this. We decided to dig into artificial intelligence risk and to bring 11 of the very accurate forecasters on these short run geopolitical questions from Phil's prior work, and 11 experts on artificial intelligence who are very concerned about risks from artificial intelligence. And we had them suggest shorter run questions that might explain some of their disagreement, that might cause them to update in the next few years on that risk being higher or lower. And we then had them forecast on these risks, and we had them produce conditional forecasts if this mechanism happens. If this short run forecast resolves positively or negatively, like if, if there are large cyber attacks uh, driven by artificial intelligence, how will that update the concern group or the skeptical group about risks from artificial intelligence? And this type of cruxing, this type of exploration of short run mechanisms is something that we're doing a lot of right now and we're excited to think about more. So this is all leading to projects that we're currently working on that I think are more relevant to this group. We're thinking about how we can do what we call full inference cycle forecasting. And this involves relying on experts to help us identify key questions. You could think of these as being, for example, the likelihood of bioweapon or nuclear weapon use in the next 20 years. We're partnering with nonprofits and research organizations. We have a project that's currently ongoing and in data collection mode where we have 100 nuclear experts who are providing us with forecasts on short run questions related to nuclear risk long-run questions related to nuclear risk and proposing policies that they think might mitigate those risks and then telling us what they think the forecasts of the efficacy of those policies are and we're currently talking to the federation of american scientists about doing something similar in the bio-risk space so we're hoping to do a lot of these projects where we conduct structured interviews of experts identify key cruxes key short-run questions that would update policymakers, decision makers and researchers about the likelihoods of these risks we want to elicit the conditional forecast from experts that I talked about on the previous slide, and then identify risk mitigating, mitigating policy ideas. We've heard people talk in questions to the keynote speaker about state and local governments, about federal policies that might 
affect risks from bioweapon use or risks from artificial intelligence? We think that these are questions that people should be asking, but also quantifying. People should be saying, if this policy comes into place, what do they think it would do to these risks that people are thinking about right now? And then our goal is to work with these nonprofits and research organizations because we want to write and circulate reports that policymakers and researchers can rely on, where we not only have qualitative information about what policies people think are important, but we also tell people why they think they're important, what the probabilities are of these policies being implemented, and if these policies are implemented, what the likelihood is of risk with and without these policies. So I'll, I'll just put two of our working papers up here. They're under review at academic journals right now. And we're excited to talk more about these projects with anyone else. Ezra, thank you so much. I'll invite you to join us. We'll introduce Phil and then we'll transition to the full panel. All right, thank you again. And so we will invite our last uh, panelist up uh, virtually, uh, Philip Tetlock is at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's professor and president and chief scientist at the Forecasting Research Institute. Uh, Philip, thank you so much for joining. Well, thank you. Having trouble with my video. Here we go. Uh, All right. Uh, so I, I don't have too much to say beyond what Ezra has said. I, I think we should open it up for, for conversation. Uh, the, the, the slide that Ezra presented on the Rosenberg et al. 2024 study um, that brought together um, the uh, talented generalist forecasters and the AI experts uh, to engage in uh, sustained debate over a period of about a month um, in which each side, it was, it was, it, they worked within an adversarial collaboration framework, uh, a term that Kahneman uh, popularized. Uh, it, within, within an adversarial collaboration framework, each side needs to demonstrate that it understands the uh, major arguments of the other side to the other side's satisfaction. Uh, ideally, each side would have a capacity to predict the predictions of the other side as well, uh, which is an interesting test of uh, perspective taking. And um, the result of that uh, sustained effort to bring together um, the subject matter experts and the, um, the, the generalists was, um, as Ezra pointed out, the generation of some interesting crux questions that have the potential to change minds once they resolve in the next few years. Um, but it changed minds very little in, in, in the near term. It, it, it was as though they were arguing past each other. And we have some interesting data on how they manage, how, how really smart people manage to argue past each other for sustained periods of time. And um, we could talk more about that later. But um, I, I didn't think I was going to be a presenter here. I'm just backing up Ezra. So why don't we turn it over to the audience? Bill, thank you so much. It's a great suggestion. We actually have an online question we'll start off with from Kibita Berger. Uh, from your perspectives, how do you see the relationship between empirical or experimental studies and computational model modeling studies? Specifically, how effective can computational models be if experimental knowledge is limited, inaccurate, biased, or different than what we previously thought? And Erica, I might call on you as you, you spoke to this uh, very cogently. Uh, do you have a thought? Yeah, um, I think the thing that's exciting about the machine learning models is that they do seem to generalize at least somewhat. And so uh, there's no point to a model where you train it on data that you've gathered and then it can just predict that data. Like the thing that's cool and exciting is that it actually can um, predict uh, results for experiments it hasn't seen. And a lot of the work um, in learning how to use these models is, is learning to understand their limitations and what they do and don't know. Um, and, uh, that is where like the scientific work comes in. Like once you have a model, you have to understand whether or not it is well suited for tasks that it wasn't directly trained on or whether or not it can infer properties that, you know, you didn't directly load the data with like tons of, tons of, um, instances of, of that property. Um, so I, I think it's th this is this is part of why it's so challenging to 
uh, generate these data sets is because it requires enormously multidisciplinary expertise to understand like what is experimentally feasible, um, what can we train the model to get out of the data, and then how should we expand the data set to further, you know, include new properties we care about. And so this this requires like discussion on a level that I think the field hasn't had before. Um, Thank you. We have a whole line of questions in the room. We'll pass it there. Hi, I have a couple of questions for Ezra. I wanted to get your take on the role of models for forecasting. Seems like your approach um, and, and some folks have shown that humans are the best forecasters. And so by asking questions, then you kind of aggregate and then combine um, the en ensemble all of these like ideas. And so I would like to know what are what are some of the current limitations of the statistical models, machine learning and, and AI in forecasting? And also we saw during the pandemic that um, our models are able to do very well short-term forecasting, especially for COVID-19 cases and death forecasts. But the long-term forecast was more um, challenging because of human behavior and variants, which a lot of the models didn't account for that. And so I'm wondering about our ability to develop models that can do long-term forecasting um, in, you know, because it seems like we could probably do very good with uh, short-term forecasts. Thanks. Great. So let me make a few points. Uh, one is that there are several research groups right now using large language models to try to forecast. And some of them are showing really interesting results. There's a new paper by Jacob Steinhardt's group at Berkeley uh, that shows that while large language models aren't yet at human levels of accuracy, they're certainly better than, you know, a coin flip and they're getting to human levels of accuracy. And so one thing that we're going to explore uh, ourselves with Jacob's group and also with other research groups that are working on this topic is how we can use AI systems and more standard time series forecasting to improve the forecasts of humans and to produce better hybrid forecasts. Uh, but I wanna make two other points. IARPA has funded a series of forecasting tournaments related to these topics. They funded one called HFC, the Hybrid Forecasting Competition, which uh, my perspective is did not show that hybrid models could do better than humans. Uh, but this was before the era of large language models. And so I think there's a world where doing something like that again would be really interesting. Uh, they also, to your second point, uh, funded a program called FOCUS. And in FOCUS, they asked human forecasters to submit forecasts about simulated environments. And there were several simulated environments, but one that speaks to your question was in, I believe, November 2019, uh, they had human competitors forecast the results of a simulated pandemic called purple pox in a world that wasn't real, but was modeled. And the thing that really struck me about the results from the purple pox forecasts is that humans were really inaccurate because the data they gave the humans was about the beginning of the fake pandemic in the simulated environment. And it turns out that if you're at the start of an exponential curve, predicting where that exponential curve is gonna go is really difficult. And so I think a takeaway I had from that is that this question of long run or short run forecasting isn't the most interesting question because some things are really interesting to really uh, easy to forecast over the long run time horizons. They're the things that are more predictable and some things are very difficult. And so we are working right now to try to figure out what types of questions are easier or more difficult to forecast over different time horizons with different types of underlying data complexity. And I think that's a completely open research question that we should do more work on. Thank you, another question in the room. Wendy, um, National Security, Economic Security. So I'm delighted to see the Federal Reserve here because I think some of the questions that have been raised touch on um, the need to challenge laissez-faire capitalism in a global competitive context where we have very large um, potential adversaries that are you know, doing business as they do it. So I love the engagement of the Federal Reserve, thank you. Um, my question was to challenge a little bit the limitation of nuclear weapons, bioweapons is catastrophic. Um, bioweapons almost seem simple based on what we have been discussing the past few days because generally you kind of understand who the target is and how to get that effect. It's a very narrow problem set in that respect. 
But if you step back and you look at the ability to direct evolution with designed constructs to impact the air, the soil, the plants, the water, with all kinds of off-target effects that we don't understand, and that's released at scale, often machine engineered, so there's not necessarily human as the standard, the human brain is the standard, but like an optimized construct, all these things being released into an integrated biological system, which speaks to each other, right, has inter interrelated impacts. So how do you factor in that piece, or I would challenge you all, figure in that piece of catastrophic risk, which is a lot of like gene drives and natural releases, not weapons, but naturally well-meant interventions by humans to direct the ecosystems in different ways and to touch it. How, how do you factor that in, or how should we factor that in as we go forward? Um, so I have two responses. First, I definitely am not presenting the views of the Federal Reserve, and I have no comment on Lizzie fair capitalism or anything like that. But uh, I do have thoughts about your, your comment on complexity. So our work, I'm not an expert on nuclear weapon use. I'm not an expert on bio risk. Uh, you're presenting some hypotheses here, or some beliefs about the complexity, the relative complexity of these topics. We would like to quantify that, and we would like to figure out if you're right. Uh, and so we hope to have many people like you, maybe the people in this room, in the survey respondents that we're gathering so that we can talk about whether uh, experts really do believe as an aggregate group that uh, bio risk is you know, more complex than nuclear risk because of environmental factors. I think some nuclear experts would disagree with you just looking at some of the responses we've had so far. Uh, they would say, well, when nuclear weapon use is widespread, that's also going to have complicated environmental effects that might cause, you know, atmospheric effects, effects on the environment that we're not thinking about right now and that are very hard to model. Uh, but we want to explore that and quantify that. So that we're really excited to do that. Good question to Tessa. Hey, Tess Alexanian from IBIS. Uh, I wanted to ask, you know, all of this forecasting ends up being data driven in some way. And, you know, I know to my epoch has a paper saying, please report your compute. And um, Erica, I think I've heard people from the line to innovate kind of, you know, rail against how PDB has really good curation standards, but other places don't. I, I guess I'm curious, I'd, I'd be curious to hear from all of the people on the panel, like, if you could get one win on data reporting, if like people start reporting this thing in this way, or they just start reporting this thing at all, what would be the win that you would want to help with your forecasts? Wait, can you repeat the last part of the question? I didn't. Yeah, you get one win on people broadly, and you, you can choose who your interest group is, start reporting something, either more clearly or they just start reporting it at all what would be most helpful for driving your forecasts yeah so certainly like having compute is especially important given how tightly this is related to performance in many of the the domains that we care about and so that that is kind of why we, we wrote that paper so having more of that seems great but i i think i think there's other things that labs are doing right now um with architectures that makes this kind of a tricky question. Like we, we don't really know what these models are like. Um, there's like increased sparsity and mixture of expert training. And we don't know how the, um, the, the models you know, improve as you scale these architectures up because um, you know, academic labs don't have the resources to actually test this. And so there's a bunch of conceptual questions that labs have just a much better understanding about about how to scale up different architectures of models that, you know, models like Ch chat GPT are based on that we just don't understand. So yeah. having ha having some of those those papers out um, seems good. I, I, I happen to, um, uh, next week, we'll, I, I'll be releasing a paper where I like might get Google to uh, disclose some of this because uh, anyway, so that, that, that should be fun and uh, uh, should be interesting. Yeah, and I remember in the Evo genomic model paper, their compute was sort of a bunch of stacked lines depending on the architecture they were using. So may maybe there's something in the intersection of reporting, you know, flops in training and architecture. I don't know. I, I don't know what a good standard with that for that would be. Yeah, that seems right. Like in general, I think having a better conceptual understanding about um, about what like compute matters, you know, training compute, fine tuning compute. What about models that are distilled? So you have a very large model and you train a smaller model in the outputs of, the, of, of, this, of this larger model. 
how, how should you think about the compute that went into that? Um, how does that kind of interface with say the reporting requirements? I'll say that the thing I would like decision makers and policymakers and researchers to do is to start reporting what they think the causal effect of the policies they're proposing would be on outcomes that they care about. So when you have groups saying that we care about risks from artificial intelligence and propose menus of 20 policies that they think might affect those risks, I would love it if they tell us what their internal model is of what their beliefs are about those risks, how those beliefs would be reduced if those policies that they're proposing were implemented. And then if there are trade-offs, like if they think that's going to negatively affect economic growth or negatively affect geopolitical tension, they should quantify that as well. Because I think sometimes these lists of policies, it's very hard to figure out which ones are actually preferred and why they're preferred and what underlying assumptions of the people arguing about these policies uh, explain differences of opinion. All right, and to our online guests, uh, any comments on if you could wave a wand and, and sort of elicit reporting or better, better data capture? Yeah, on, on the data side, I think folks in computer science often are unaware of what the Wild West is like out here in biology. Um, I recently wrote a opinion piece about how it's um, it's shocking actually that people who do life science research don't always fully report the DNA constructs that they're using. So in, you know, the analogy is that in life science, you can program life with DNA. So it's like your code. And in computer science, you upload your code to GitHub. Like that's what you do. Like if you're trying to publish, you have to tell people what you, what you did. And in life science, people sometimes, you know, attach their code as like a PNG <laughs> or, or don't, you know, list their constructs at all. And, um, I think it's, uh, I think like in the past couple of years, people have caught on to the idea that um, writing down what you did and putting it in a machine readable format has huge value in the long term, even if you don't know what it is in the short term. And so uh, just getting to the point where like the entire biology literature uses very simple like standards of like, please actually upload files with all of your DNA in it um would be enormously helpful moving forward for for having the work that's done today actually be uh like reused in the future when we when when we can sort of machine process more of the literature just just a quick comment i i spent actually in computer science it can be quite bad especially from some of the labs so i spent my my weekend last weekend um, downloading images from a paper and putting it into plot digitizer to like extract the pixel locations of like a hundred points and uh, and and read the RGB values and map that onto like a color uh, gradient. Uh, so that, that was a nightmare. Uh, it, the things we do to replicate the literature, I have like typed in. You know, you you read the supplement and you have to retype like a thousand characters of DNA which like human brains are not good at, right? So, I mean, I, I think we we make life hard for ourselves um, for no reason. And I wish people, uh, um, yeah, made it slightly easier. All right, and back to the room to Steph. Hi, Steph Vitalis at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Um, Erica, I was really glad to hear you speak about some of those intrinsic limitations to biological data sets. Um, so as an X-ray crystallographer by training, you know, a big challenge for us was that only proteins with really specific characteristics even can be crystallized. Um, so, you know, I think the stat right now is like 218 something thousand uh, structures in the PDB, but it only represents like 90,000 unique proteins. Um, so I guess my question maybe for the first two panelists is what's the trade-off between database size and representation? Um, I know we had heard about how size is increasing and how it impacts performance, but you know, what do those intrinsic limitations sort of do with that? And then maybe for our second uh, set of speakers, how should we responsibly communicate those limitations to better enable forecasts and, and predictions about what's possible? Could I maybe go first? So I think a, an interesting contrast to the challenge we face in building predictive models in life science versus the former successes in physics like CERN, 
are that in physics, you can literally compute like what do the like how big does your accelerator need to be in order to resolve this measurement you want to take to within this error right like you can literally compute how much data you need um to win and in biology we don't have that um we we like fundamentally um don't know how many uh crystal structures we needed to build a predictive model we were not even thinking about it at the time but we we fundamentally don't know how much data we need and uh, data can be like if you have a lot of data points in your data set, it sounds impressive in a press release. But if you have varied the data in ways that are just cosmetic and are not actually improving model performance, no one cares. And so I, I think we we have a real challenge. Again, this is a like a multidisciplinary expert challenge of like as we start collecting large data sets as a field we would do well to be supervising that collection and uh, embedding analysis of whether or not um, new sorts of data are actually improving model performance in, in ways we care about. And that's a discussion to be had by everyone from the, again, experimentalists, automation folks, machine learning folks, uh, policymakers who maybe care about certain you know, models being good at certain applications. Um, and that's an entire like social infrastructure that we don't have yet um and and should be thinking about and I, I would also argue it will save us a lot of money right like the pdb is filled with 10 billion dollars of data but probably didn't need to have that many structures in it in order to get a predictive model of as you say the tiny fraction of the protein universe that is well structured and can be crystallized right so so we can win with less effort if we coordinate and start systematically tackling that problem that you describe of what do we want our model to be good at and thus what data should we collect next? Yeah, just so, you know, the past five years or so of language modeling, I think the big lesson there has been just massively pre-training these models on a bunch of data, uh, much of which is kind of lower quality or like not particularly useful for the paths that you want to deploy your model on happens to just be very effective. And so we have some understanding about how these models are able to learn these very subtle representations of, of kind of tasks and processing and develop some kind of internal circuitry that enables them to perform the relevant tasks, even when kind of training on a, a bunch of kind of low quality data. And so that that is just really helpful. And so just purely scaling up the size of your data sets is just very useful. Um, and, and it can make it make the model more efficient at learning, you know, tasks that you might care more about. So you might need less kind of specific, like specialized, high quality, expensive data um, to, to get good performance if you first pre-train it on, on just a ton of of, of kind of um, unsuper on kind of unlabeled data that you train in an unsupervised way. Um, so that's that's really the kind of lesson from from kind of conventional language modeling, and I, I suspect a similar thing might be true for for biological sequence models. Um, but I think it's kind of a an open question how much um, you need this kind of very high quality data set, um, right? Uh, and 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 how much the kind of need for that might diminish as we are able to just scale up this pre training in this unsupervised way. Um, I'm I'm curious. Um, uh, to hear a response from from the other panelists on on this um, question about uh, you know how much how much of this kind of high quality data do you need and how much you know pre training on on kind of just in this unsupervised way with unlabeled um, you know sequence data might might be uh, kind of a, a a substitute for for maybe this like much more highly annotated detailed uh, kind of protein sequence data. Um, anybody want to come in on that? I think we're running a little short on time. We'll try to get through the folks in the room. Over to Barbara. 
Yes, uh, hi, uh, Barbara Del Castello, Rand. Um, my question is for Philip and Ezra. Um, Philip, you mentioned specifically that um, in the, I believe the Rosenberg paper that your, your two groups were kind of talking across each other rather than to each other. And I know that anchoring is kind of a, a, a ongoing issue in expert elicitation. And I'd be interested in how you kind of maybe approached anchoring um, as kind of a side bit. But the, the short question I have is, um, do you think that that increasing the diversity of the kind of backgrounds of your subject matter experts would have benefited the conversation in terms of, uh, you know, having a little bit more diversity of thought you know, as being a cross-sectoral issue. And if you could create the ideal uh, group of uh, SMEs to create maybe a collective super forecaster, who would you bring back to do this expert elicitation? Oh. Uh, that's 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 a great question. Uh, so the, the adversarial collaborations in Rosenberg et al. were uh, limited to interactions between the generalists and talented generalist forecasters and this AI subject matter experts. But in an ideal world, um, I think we'd want to be much more systematic and ambitious. I think we would want to scope out the relevant populations of experts. I mean, in, in these proceedings, I, there, are, there are two technologies that each of which is very complex that are interacting with each other. Um, so you would ideally want to have subject matter experts within each of those domains. And you'd also want to have uh, representation, viewpoint diversity representation within each, uh, within the, the biosphere and within the AI sphere. And um, you would make a major effort just to make sure that each side can accurately predict the other's predictions and can accurately understand the other before you attempt to cross-validate and without a sample questions. Um, so it would be much more expensive, much more ambitious. It would require a great deal of human cooperation. It requires people to buy into the idea that it's possible if we organize ourselves um, systematically uh, to, make, to make our um, collective conversation smarter and faster. Uh, if I can just say two things, one on the anchoring point, um, we elicited forecasts individually before we put people on teams, and we saw very little difference. And so I think the question we should always ask about anchoring is, can we even elicit forecasts from people in an unanchored way, or have they already been anchored by a very polarized debate before they got to our questions? Uh, and I think that was the case here. Um, and I do think that there was a response to diversity of belief and opinion from our first study, which was to ignore the people who you didn't agree with or who to ignore the people who you thought were expressing different viewpoints. And so the Rosenberg paper was really trying to say, let's take two more homogenous groups. They disagree a little bit with each other, but they mainly think that their group of people is correct. And let's just focus them on disagreeing with each other. Um, in the first study, when we brought on people with different amounts of expertise when it came to AI or nuclear risk, uh, I think they mainly siloed themselves and were not impressed by the argument quality of the other groups. And that might've been correct, but it definitely reduced the quality of the debate. Thank you. And we'll give the last word to Willie here in the room. Willie Chertman, um, working for Senator Todd Young's office in the Senate. Um, so one thing that showed up kind of early with large language models was evidence of transfer learning. So I think even GPT-2 was you know, bad at poetry, but not terrible. And maybe also answering questions. Are we seeing evidence of transfer learning in biological models or has that not really occurred yet? Maybe a question for Erica or Tim Hay or whoever wants to take it. Yeah, uh, to some extent. So certainly um, models that are trained on protein sequences, uh, even though they have no idea that protein sequences correspond to something that could fold into a physical object, um, if you look inside of those models, you discover that actually they've deduced that proteins can fold. And this is why the, the, um, the language models, the protein language models are actually very good at predicting structure. Um, it is also the case that if you look inside those models, they know a lot about the proteins. They can identify like which domain of life the protein comes from, for example. Um, there is some, I, I mean, I think it's like a, very active area of research, but there's some some indication that um, unlike language models where scaling um, compute always helps improve model performance, essentially, 
Um, that may not be the case for doing protein function prediction, um, but the sort of, uh, we'll see. Um, and I, I would say like notably, uh, protein function transfer learning has not happened and people have been trying that. So protein function space appears to be large enough that a model trained to predict the function of one protein normally you like it doesn't help you when you when you turn around and try to predict the function of another protein so so that's still a, a tough nut, nut no one's cracked yeah, maybe to quickly follow up on this question of um whether some pro pro performance dimension scale or not i i, I think there, there was this big question in language modeling about this as well whether you get kind of consistent scaling across the board or whether you might get inverse scaling or just like Kind of un unpredictable fluctuations with scale, and um, and and it's seen and and so people had run this prize, this competition where like, show me the most compelling case of like inverse scaling in language models, and my interpretation of that competition of that work is that actually you know some of that is fairly ambiguous and often you do end up getting scaling as long as you just throw enough compute at it and so there were some results of like oh actually this inverse inverse scaling is just like this kind of inverse u curve where like you start you start going down and then and then you kind of return to the the, the usual scaling behavior and so um so the demonstrations weren't super compelling and so my my bet my money would be on like yeah things probably just improve with scale for protein language models um but kind of uncertain all right great discussion please join me in thanking our, our panel participants and before we break i'm going to hand it over to andrew who's going to give us our instructions for our breakout discussion Great. So like Greg mentioned, we're going to uh, break now just for a brief break right before we get into our breakout group discussion. So just um, I, I do want to note we're going to have a slight schedule change after our breakout groups. Um, we'll kind of transition right into lunch and then we'll reconvene around 1235 or so for our report backs from our breakout groups. So that's uh, relevant for everybody here in the room as well as those online. Um, some quick notes on our, our, our breakout groups then. So for those of you turning tuning in virtually, um, similar to yesterday, if you're uh, listening into the, the webcast, you have those two options. You can either independently contribute to the Jamboards, which are linked on the agenda. You also have a link to a live Zoom if you prefer to kind of interactively uh, join a, a Zoom call um, with, with others tuning into the webcast. For our speakers and panelists on the Zoom, you can remain on the one that you're currently on if you're able to uh, participate in round table chat. Um, for those of you in person, we're going to kind of uh, organize ourselves a little bit um, differently so uh, groups one two and three so groups one is with deep d two with jess diamond and three with greg you'll all transition to room 125 which is where we had lunch yesterday that's where the those three breakout groups will convene and then uh group four uh will have you here in the front to my left of the auditorium group five will be in the front of the auditorium to the right and then if you turn around as you kind of look back six, seven, eight, and and nine, and similar to yesterday, we're going to combine groups nine and 10, you'll convene kind of um, in the aisle where the, the posted signs are. If you aren't sure what group you're in or hadn't ha haven't had a chance, there's that list um, of breakout groups staff, as well as uh, there's a couple extra copies too, if, we, if you want to take a, a quick look during our break. Um, feel free to come up to me as well if you have any questions. Um, but with that, I'll... Uh, Dismiss you all for your quick bio break and we'll convene our breakout groups in a few minutes. Thank you.
All right, I know folks are still trickling back in, but if we can go ahead and get started, we have a, a lot on our plates for this afternoon, hopefully some great conversation ahead. If lunch was any indication, I think that'll very much be the case. So uh, we, at this point in time, would like to begin with some brief uh, brief outs on our breakout session that we had uh, before and during lunch. I know each group was asked to identify an individual to just take a minute or two to describe some of the, the discussion in the groups on mitigating risks and um, some of the biosecurity challenges in this area. If those folks would like to come forward and participate in the discussion, I'll offer a couple minutes now to make your way up and we can go from there. Okay, hi, I'm giving the report back for groups nine and 10. Um, so we had a really interesting and productive conversation. Um, we had somebody from the Bureau of Industry and Security in our group. So we ended up talking a lot about the Department of Commerce um, and how they play a really important role in this whole um, landscape, but we could better support them. So two things that would be helpful would be if experts from outside of government could provide more feedback Oh yeah, could you, can you hear me now? Okay, um, let's see. Yeah, if experts could, from outside of government, could provide more feedback by attending interagency working group meetings or responding to RFIs, requests for information um, on the, thank you, Eric. <laughs> Do you want me to start over? Okay, I'm just gonna keep going. Go for it. Um, okay. Um, on the government side, they can provide better support for the Department of Commerce. So unlike other departments like DOE and DOD that can resource out to national labs or FFRDCs, um, Commerce doesn't necessarily have that same option. So um, potentially that presents a structural weakness. Um, and so this is somewhere that Congress can step in to provide more resources. Um, on the public-private partnership side of things, one really good point that was raised um, is that smaller and mid-sized companies sometimes find it difficult to innovate um, because they don't have access to networks of experts that can help them navigate the complex policy and regulatory landscapes. Um, so providing that access um, to those networks and potential resources for that would be helpful. Um, and then we ended by talking about ways that we could potentially speed up our own innovation. So something that someone in our group, Tom, brought up was that it is... Um, one place we could start is by increasing our surveillance of the biology world, so um, doing genomic sequencing. And so whatever entity, government, industry, PPPs that could support that initiative would be helpful. Okay. Wonderful, thanks. Hey, Tessa here reporting in for group three. Uh, trying to put a lot of things, so I'm gonna try to just pull out a couple of, uh, a couple of trends. One was trying to think beyond pathogens and beyond pharma. So what are the risks that should be considered in the security framework for research that go beyond pathogens? Um, you know, how can we identify risks in the ag sector, in the bioindustrial sector? Um, and I think those both seemed like places where government industry could work in partnership to identify risks. Uh, Back on the pharma side, we talked a bit about clinical trials and how improving clinical trials seems like one of the bottlenecks for getting medical countermeasures out into the world. So uh, that's a place that government and industry could partner specifically on getting things like small molecule drugs out there faster. Um, government seems like it could be doing some work on data infrastructure and model sharing infrastructure, as well as you know carrots and sticks to encourage or require deposits into databases, maybe connecting that to uh, research oversight or publication requirements. Uh, two more things. We talked beyond just customer screening about personnel screening. So is for what defining in industry, what are the areas where you should be doing additional uh, insider threat screening, either in the hiring process or restricting what people can do in a laboratory alone, maybe if you're working with certain pathogens. Um, and then lastly, Partnership between government and industry on clarifying export controls in the growing bioeconomy and you know how, how that should be affecting work and partnering on an insurance requirement for laboratories working with potential pandemic pathogens, possibly with the government as an insurer of last resort, because we weren't confident that you would be able to get private insurance companies to insure people against potential pandemic catastrophes. 
Thanks very much. I, I'm laughing thinking about calling my insurance company and telling them about the lab I'm going to set up and the things I'm going to do. They would not like that. Um, anybody else like to report out on our, our sessions yeah, over there? I'm on this side. Oh, thank you. And even in red, I'm sorry, I missed you. No worries. Uh, so I, we were a group six and seven combined with Mia, Sarah, Joseph, Nicholas, and John. And some of the key points that were brought up was that benchmark what is working now. Use the benchmarks already that we have set as rather than starting from scratch from other fields. As examples, uh, Biopharma already has in place a good set of regulatory benchmarks that are working for approval of well, it, 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 for FDA approved drugs as an example. Our other applications that were called out were looking at as it, for examples were egg bio. Um, then also focus not on the output but in the enabling tools, not focus less on um, the biological entities rather than on how AI could be um, vulnerable and accessed. So identify where the harm would come in at the root cause. Uh, combine subject matter experts to develop AI to provide insight into those security threats, because that wouldn't be an expertise that would come from governing agencies. It needs to come from those writing the code themselves. Um, other things that we that were brought up is that it's less a concern perhaps about the regulation that could be in place as it is the implementation of regulation in the workforce or in, in academia. Uh, additional points that I want to quickly summarize is that uh, constraining tech and innovation to a single government body could be crippling for innovation, um, but there also needs to be milestones at that and rubrics and guidelines for those companies. So some of the things that were brought up to address that where can we develop consensus standards through the industries like um, NIST or ASME and have a seal or a badge of security measures for industry, uh, for AI. Um, other things were that if having vetted AI that defines what a set of best, best practices are for the field and also having financial incentive for self-regulation. Other things to note is that the government houses some fundamental databases in health and in bio. And so they have a, a seat of power in, in some ways to, to have people rise up to the standards. So those are the main things. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. So <clears throat> I can represent group four. Um, a lot of the things that we have said were also said. I'll point out some of the things I think are more unique or more that we emphasized. So for all of these roles, we kind of emphasized communication was going to be key but it was how we could have quick feedback loops on that communication. So if government and industry were communicating, how could we get that feedback and then iterate quickly to learn from that, do something different based on that. One of the ideas were what might trial regulations look like guidelines, more agile mechanisms that allowed kind of prototyping these ideas, partnerships between industry and government to, to see how those played out and how they could affect customers and their, and, and their interests and things. So some innovative potential modeling between the government and industry. The other thing that I think was kind of that I hadn't heard so much or was unique to our conversation was the idea that if you looked at the financial markets and valuations and how companies are where people are investing, you might be able to forecast technology development, see where people are putting their money, where investments being made, and use that information to roadmap where uh, technology is going. Um, and then think about, so that's what maybe happens on the industrial side maybe in an academic or government side, you do something similar with publications and research funding, using where people are putting uh, data, where people are publishing, where people are emphasizing, and use that to see where you might be headed. Great, thank you. And our next group? Then in group five, uh, I think a lot of the points were covered really well already, uh, but I think one thing that was interesting within our group that we talked a lot about was basically thinking about not just regulations and sticks, but also thinking about carrots in terms of pushing private industry and practice towards investing within these particular strategic areas. So I think the analogy was drawn to a space race, or maybe a grand challenge, a space race uh, in terms of towards uh, biotechnology, biomanufacturing, and a lot of these other strategic industries, uh, especially within the current landscape where private investment has been more wary of it, especially without more concrete applications in a lot of different cases or long timelines, as well as a threat landscape in terms of many other players, state actors, and whatnot willing to either collaborate uh, collaborate, quote unquote, uh, two different things, and also just uh, investment landscape within, say, sovereign wealth funds and other folks who are willing to invest in these technologies and potentially take a leadership role or at least attempt to take a leadership role away from the U.S., especially given 
our talk as well within the group, a lot of this proprietary data, which has been a big theme of the entire workshop, a lot of this proprietary data is potentially being created within silos. And within these silos, you could have them start to become little nation states within companies, but literally also uh, basically collated within specific countries uh, without good collaboration. So we also talked a little bit about the regulatory landscape being quite fractured in this particular way. I am not a good person to summarize this, but apparently there's different things in terms of law of the sea, law of the, that the sequences, you can't just go in and take them from different countries or whatever. There are different things that you have to do, say if you're a US researcher going to like different countries and basically getting some of those sequences. And in terms of being able to have a clear regulatory framework for how that works would also be helpful just for rules of the road. Excellent, thank you. Representing groups one and two. Um, so again, a lot of the points have been covered. So I'll just cover, cover, to speak uh, about a couple of topics we touched upon. One is that the intra-agency report on data for bioeconomy initiative. Uh, it's a 28 page report, but it mentioned biosecurity only two times. Um, so we could, this has to be an intra-agency effort, but if there is no clear ownership, it could just very quickly fall through the cracks. So we thought that there should be a owner who will uh, clearly define a framework for, of security challenges. Uh, it could be both biosecurity or uh, economic uh, impact on companies that are using, uh, that are doing biomanufacturing or, use, or developing biotechnologies. Um, we talked about how the requirements should be scaled. If it's a smaller company, maybe they don't have to follow the same level of regulation as larger companies. Of course, it has to be risk-based, but uh, smaller companies to avoid uh, impede or putting a lot of overhead on them around regulation, um, maybe allowing them to, to innovate before they start uh, following all the regulation that is in the book. And then um, we, we could um, then mine the data that uh, these companies are providing in terms of responding to the framework that we put forward or I guess the, the entity that uh, owns this will put forward, uh, but that would be self-reported data, just like publications and other, other uh, uh, reports. So we should also probably think about developing physical tools that could sample from uh, the various experiments that are conducted in labs uh, that go along with instrumentation and identify biosecurity risk and report it immediately. Great, thanks. So just to <clears throat> recap some of those I ideas that were uh, common across many of the groups, thinking about indicators for technology development, ways that we can potentially be leveraging financing and perhaps research output to anticipate what's coming, drawing on expert guidance, not only to do that, but also to inform how we're interacting or thinking about the, the risk landscape, as well as how we're shaping recommendations for mitigation of some of those potential harms. Thinking more broadly about risks beyond pathogens, uh, focusing on the, the root of harm rather than potential processes or outputs that are, are distinct from that root cause, uh, as well as things like data, uh, how data is potentially leaving the country, how we are um, potentially at risk of uh, weakening elements of the bioeconomy that we don't always think about first and foremost. Um, a, a number of our groups mentioned clarity and definition both in our guidelines and in terms of benchmarks and some opportunities there to draw on other industries for some uh, inspiration. And repeatedly came up uh, along the same lines, challenges in navigating the regulatory landscape. So much to think about there. Um, the, the last point I'll mention here is just implementation. Again, perhaps a, a much broader conversation to be had with many different perspectives required in order to think about how this is done uh, meaningfully and, and actionably. So, We'll have some time later in the day uh, during our closeout to, to revisit any remaining points on that front. Uh, and for, for those online, uh, I'm sure this afternoon we'll have the, the chat function available as well if there are other points that folks would like to drop in. For now though, we'll turn to our next session, uh, drivers of innovation. So thinking about what the properties are that are really moving us forward and, and accelerating our work at the nexus of biotech, AI, and automation. We have a couple of goals for this session that are really motivated by our broader objective of coming up with actionable, op actionable opportunities to strengthen and sustain a really vibrant and dynamic biotech uh, ecosystem in the country. Our first goal is thinking about what works. What are the common elements of highly innovative organizations or ecosystems that we're aware of within biotech and AI or elsewhere? 
Second, what are the impediments to innovation? Where are we seeing challenges in front of us that if we could overcome, we could move forward faster, better, more efficiently, whatever that might be? And finally, innovation can't exist in a vacuum. Uh, to have the impacts we're looking for, we need to think about how to turn innovations into realities. So what are the challenges in that path from idea to early research, to transition, to ultimately adoption and implementation that we need to overcome to, to bring these things to light? We have three excellent speakers on today's panel. Uh, we'll begin with Dr. Teresa Good from uh, the NSF's Directorate for Biological Sciences. Each of our speakers will have about 10-ish minutes, <laughs> give or take. And uh, after, after each speaks, we'll take one or two questions and open up for uh, panel questions. Teresa, over to you. Wow, it's bright up here. Um, so one of the benefits of being in the last session is everything has already been said. So if you wanted to doze off, um, you could. I think that they told me I should try to be provocative. Yeah, we're not going to let that. <laughs> the, the, you know, and I'm not sure that that provocative, but certainly I'll be fast and I will try to be entertaining. Um, uh, well, I'm not, forget about that. Just, I will just go. Um, anyway, so I am from the National Science Foundation. I spent 20 years as a professor. So I, the, we at NSF, we mostly fund academics. I come from that community. So I'm going to frame my remarks. You know, that that's just the context that I'm coming from. The other thing uh, that, I mean, if you don't know about NSF, we have historically been a funder of basic research art. Um, mission is to promote the progress of science um, by investing in research, um, as well as making investments to increase capacity in the U.S. to conduct and translate research to have societal benefit, whether that's jobs or industries or other public good. Um, and our mission is also to ensure the national defense. So while I told Cliff earlier that we will never do anything in that space, I, I will walk that back just a little bit. Um, and so we do need to be concerned about things like the competitive landscape. Who else is, you know, who else is innovating? What other countries are innovating and ensuring that the US remains competitive. But we also do need to start thinking about, and, I, and it has not been historically the mission of NSF to think about research security. So we do need to think about that and I will follow up on that. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the other things that are critical to our mission, we are supposed to be empowering talent everywhere to ensure that everyone can fully participate and benefit from science and engineering advances. Um, so we really do focus on democratizing access um, to the resources and infrastructure that you need to do science and, and innovation um, and expand that geography of innovation. Um, so, uh, and, you know, in, in that kind of uh, same kind of vein, we just set up a new directorate, the Technology Innovation and Partnerships Directorate. And it is the first time that NSF has a, a significant part of its mission to also be translating the impact of basic research to have benefits on society. Um, and, you know, and so I'm, uh, you know, and things at the intersection of AI and automated laboratories and biotech are certainly in that, that vein of between the basic research and that translation, and there are lots of opportunities there. Um, so, you know, some of the things that are going on at NSF, we are in the middle of our first biofoundries competition. We are thinking about the ways that we need to enable access to infrastructure um, and, and enable that. And, and spread that infrastructure every place. I think that many of us have seen infrastructure in pockets across the, the country or in, only in wealthy universities. And so how do we ensure that we, we have, that other people have access to infrastructure? So that is, that's an important thing. We also have just spun up a couple of ideas labs um, where we are trying to think about how do we bring groups of people together to catalyze innovation or innovative ideas? How do you accelerate protein design or how do you accelerate kind of cell-free biomanufacturing? And so if you're interested in any of those things, then you should talk to David and Cliff, raise your hand, um, and they will tell you what's going on at NSF. Um, so, so the other context of, you know, that's NSF and its mission, my, so 20 years as an academic, my first job at NSF, they made me the program director of this thing called an engineering research center, the Synthetic Biology Engineering Research Center at Berkeley. 
And it was the first time I saw people with lots of money and the money, NSF only gave them $40 million for an engineering research center, but they also had all of this money that Gates had given them to, uh, to make artemisinin in a microorganism and that the DOE had given them uh, to, you know, for their Bioenergy Institute, JVEI. And so there was a huge amount of resources there at that place and, and many really creative faculty members who got together. Um, and because there was money, there was infrastructure, there were some really creative faculty members, all of these really creative young people wanted to come work with them. So people like Doug Densmore and, and many of his friends um, ended up, you know, ended up going through Sinberg. So it was this great training environment for people where they had lots of, they, they could do lots of different things. They had access to automation that tools that most people didn't have access to. And so it gave them a lot more flexibility in what they could pursue. And that really, so how do we create environments like that over and over again, where you don't have to compete for resources, you're not spending all of your time writing grants, that you've got the money and the, the infrastructure so you just can go and create. Um, and, and we don't do that very often. So lots of things that came out of Sinberg were, um, were, were really cute, perhaps not that practical. Some in the beginning, the academics didn't really listen to what their industrial advisory board was telling them in terms of what would be practical. I think they did better over time integrating and listening to each other. So that's another piece that I think is important is that if that having that mixture of academics and industry together created a different kind of ecosystem than you get normally. Um, the other thing that I think now as I, Cliff, I do listen to what you say every once in a while. So this conversation over lunch, it's like, we don't do, you know, why do we have NSF only focuses on the promote part of, of what we do in biotechnology. We do not focus on the protect. And I'm like, well, we don't know enough of us have security clearances. We don't know how to do that. Um, but maybe if we are going to build the next generation technologies, if we're going to combine AI automation to do this next generation of biotechnology and do it really fast, that maybe we do have to start bringing in people who think about biosecurity with people who think about how do you advance the technology. And maybe we have to have them in those centers so that that is also part of the ecosystem instead of siloing that. Um, and so I haven't figured out how that would work, but I did listen to what you said. And maybe that is part of how we make that secret sauce. Um, and so, okay, what do, we do, what do I really think we need as drivers of innovation? Okay, I said talked about access to infrastructure um, that should enable um, uh, democratization, that, that many people should have access to infrastructure. We're going to need a fair amount of money to do that, but that's an aside. Um, that we should, that, that, that um, infrastructure also has to, that includes the robotics, includes the, the compute power. Um, there's got to be a way to be innovate in measurement that we um, Francis Arnold talked about it this morning. Doing those screenings are really hard. There are some measurements that are easy. There are lots of other measurements that are not as easy to do in an automated way. So we need to innovate in the measurement side. Um, we also need to be able to do some bespoke experiments. If you just thought about kind of, if you used AI to design your experiments, you would have never thought about, uh, or you would have never figured out how to get um, silicon into a, an enzyme or do silicon chemistry or degrade silicon containing particles or materials um, with an enzyme. So that really required some human human innovation to be incorporated um, into the design, build, test, learn cycle. And you needed bespoke processes. So everything can't be automated and standard. Well, it could be automated, but it can't all be standardized. So you need to be able to have variation on a theme. Um, you need to be able to bring in new ideas. You need to be able to see kind of when there is something, uh, an outlier in there. Um, we have talked a lot about, I mean, we do need standards, but we need to be able to have, to, be able to, have, um, to include new innovations in workflows. Um, Data. We've talked a lot about fair data. I think that 
should it all be open access? Certainly that is a government perspective that if you if we're paying for you to create the data, then it should be available to the public. But if I'm going to enable innovation um, or kind of to monetize that data, then, then perhaps some of it has to be private. And so I think we have to figure out the balance. This idea that perhaps we need to redo all of the biological data is gonna be a hard one. I think there's gotta be a way to, um, there is a, there's a lot of useful data there, but we need soon to just to figure out how do we create the new standards for data and metadata such that we can grow that data and ensure that it is reliable. Um, uh, should we be able to do um, genome to phenome to be able to predict any kind of organism we want to design, safe ones and not safe ones? I think that that is really a, a laudable goal. I think that, again, we have to figure out which parts of that should be private and which parts of that should be public. Um, and so that's got to be a conversation. Um, AI. Um, I think AI by itself does does tremendous things, but AI coupled with physical constraints, I think is really gonna be important to include um, that an AI will get you someplace, but it doesn't get you every place. Um, and so we need to, to think about that. We're gonna need more computing power. Um, that if I remember hearing from recursion, what they're building just to do what they do, we don't have enough computing power. So we're gonna need more of that. I think the other thing we are, I haven't, you know, we've talked a little bit about on the first day is the workforce that we will need. Most um, academics are not, and um, their students are not really thinking about how to use automation in their design of experiments and how to incorporate that. Um, we're going to need people who, who know how to do those kinds of experiments, who know how to leverage that power in order to do Kind of innovate in biotechnology. It also means you might not need nearly as many graduate students, or what it means to be a graduate student is going to be something totally different. Um, and I think there need to be more use cases. Yeah, designing proteins is a great use case. Um, designing organisms or synthetic circuits is a great, great use case. But if we're going to get adoption more broadly, and more people are going to use these technologies in order to innovate, then I think that we've got to show them the way. Um, and so with that, I probably have a lot more things written here, um, but that's probably it for now. So um, thanks. And I'm, I'm thrilled to hear what the rest of the panel has to say. Join me at the table here if you'd like. Pardon me? You can join me at the table here if you'd like. And sit Maybe under the one of you. You're wrong. Thanks very much for those great remarks. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions from the room or online. It's very low. That works too. Angelo Cangelosi from APL. Um, how do you recommend that we recreate the next Simberg without that external funding, which from your accounting was sizable? And it, um, is, it, is it something that you can create? Is it, is it realistic, I guess, is another question. So I think that there are there are places where I think if we, I think perhaps it can't all come from the federal government, but that if, you know, so perhaps there are ways that we do public private partnerships. Um, I think that there's, you know, and perhaps we do more partnerships with philanthropy and the private sector and the public and in order to bring, to create those spaces where there can be that kind of innovation. But I don't think you can do it without the resources. And just another question. You mentioned that human innovation is always required, um, but in the age of large language models that we're living in, do you foresee that ever being the case where it is less necessary than it has been in the past? Meaning if folks are trying to say, recreate L large language model co-scientist applications. So 
I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I wish I was, uh, I should be like Francis Arnold and say, this is outside of my expertise. It is outside of my expertise, but what I'm oh, gonna tell you what I think anyway. Um, <laughs> that, um, I like it, <laughs> Yeah, so I think right now, AL will get you the, the low hanging fruit. We can get that right away. Um, I cannot design very well uh, proteins that have flexible loops. I need the, the, that dynamics. I can't do that yet. Why can't I do that? Because we don't have enough data to show us the way. Will we ever have, I think, and so, so I think I'll need human innovation to get to those outliers. Um, so, um, but I think I, I think that will be the interesting space. And I, so someone, I, and I can't remember if it was here, it must've been perhaps in the last day or two, we talked about, um, so what do we do? Um, like China is always there. It's kind of out there as the, the competitor that we hold that, you know, that we have to outcompete. Well, that where we have historically outcompeted is in that the way we integrate humans into the cycle. Um, and maybe we just have to keep on doing that. I don't know. Anyway. Thank you. You mentioned, um, excuse me, you, you mentioned thinking about ways of distributing innovation and, and kind of uh, bringing in a broader network. And um, I guess the question is, do you think it's primarily a concern of financial resources to fund those, especially thinking about things that NSF already does, like EPSCO or the exciting things out of TIP with the regional innovation engines, or are there different strategies or, or methods that are needed, especially at this intersection of AI, automation, and bio that need to be included in considering how we equitably distribute innovation and our resources. I'm smiling because I'm thinking of what is the the right answer and the correct answer and then the, what I really think. And so there's a balance, right? Um, um, I should not have admitted to that. Um, but um, <laughs> it's the end you of the kind thing. Of make yourself there. Yeah. Right. So, There is a special sauce of really um, kind of creative people and resources, um, and that can happen any place. Um, that resources have concentrated in certain places in the country. Um, if I suddenly did all of my investments instead, and I did it for a long enough period of time in uh, in some place that historically has not been well invested in, would that then start happening there? Perhaps, you know, so I, I think it is, um, but there's a long, there's a long tail of all of the things we used to do that, um, that there's, um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Um, all of the, like, because we have invested historically for a long period of time, say in the Bay Area, there's lots of industry there as well that will attract students to go to. There's lots of other things that have built up around those ecosystems. So it will take us an equally long period of time to build up other ecosystems. And we need to, because um it, it's it's time but but it will take more than just one grant excellent thank you so much so our next speaker uh is james wang he is a general partner at creative ventures uh and james is making his way up now all right Thank you, Jessica, and uh, thank you, Teresa, because we actually do a lot of investments from companies that were funded by the NSF and NIH. So definitely contributing to the innovation ecosystem, including that to towards commercialization. So for us, uh, we're Creative Ventures, where I am. I'm James. Uh, in terms of the firm Creative Ventures, we're an early stage deep tech firm, uh, VC firm. We invest in AI, synthetic biology, and advanced materials in these particular areas. 
this has been an amazing workshop. It's very much uh, outside of the areas that I typically sort of hear about or talk about or whatnot, and I've learned a huge amount. And just based on the sessions and breakout sessions and things, I think I've changed my notes on what I was going to say three or four times. So I apologize, I'm scrolling through here just because so many great conversations have happened and I've incorporated more and more stuff into it. Uh, and I hope it fits within 10 minutes. So within the, that particular perspective, I'm going to talk a little bit more from the commercial and investment perspective and talk especially around AI, which is more my specialty rather than biology. But a lot of this does still fit into the idea of what specific areas have particular commercial value and what particular areas will probably attract uh, private investment. So the thing in terms of this kind of innovation is it's hard to be completely subject matter agnostic. That has been a thing that software investing has been able to get away with for quite a while just because it has such low marginal cost and low, uh, low in upfront investment cost. That's not the case within biology for certain, but it's not even the case for AI. If you look at it and think about it, AI requires spending a bunch of money to gather the data, spending a bunch of money to train the data before you're actually serving customers with those models. And then by the time you're serving customers with those models, because you're doing inference on them, you're actually spending real money to actually go out and serve these particular customers. The entire paradigm that VC has typically invested with and VC has typically done within the past, say, 10 or 15 years is actually quite outside of that particular paradigm. So it's interesting now that we have a lot of these different areas that are developing in this way. So I think one of the interesting things just from an observation perspective from an investor is we have talked a lot about data during this entire workshop, right? And I think I was trying to count up the number of different drug discovery startups that we've turned down in the past six months. And I think I got to around a hundred and stopped counting. And the big reason why is the thing that we've talked about a lot in this workshop and why it has trouble attracting private investment, which is the data sets just aren't there. If someone is telling me that they're going to be able to use an AI and generate these particular areas of being able to say perfectly predict or not even perfectly, but in a strong way predict in a commercial fashion, what the next therapeutic or whatnot is and the pharmacokinetics of it. In general, we just haven't seen that actually pan out either in scientific literature or in commercial practice. So what we're more interested in and what we've been more interested in is actually within certain areas in biomanufacturing, but a big part of that and a big part of this that I think goes into a sort of a security question as well, is we're interested in ones that are able to both do biomanufacturing, scale up those things, but also generate data on top of it to have further commercial interest. So as an example, we have a company that is able to turn fermentation tanks using acoustic waves into flat, into thousands of essentially flat areas where uh, cell therapies, so cells can actually grow out. So versus a traditional, say, yeast fermentation or whatnot, you actually have the ability to uh, do that in terms of building scale-up uh, platforms for cell therapy, but also collect data on that and have different uh, companies run on their platform and be able to further commercialize that in the future. So in terms of a lot of these different things, I think the, the key factor in terms of why biotech and AI within it is quite different is in some of that data because I think a lot of the interest in areas around currently for VC, and I know it's not inside this room, it's not within this particular area, but for a lot of VCs, they're all interested in foundational models. I can tell you that from a uh, industry perspective for VC. Uh, they are interested in these models that are supposed to be like software platforms that capture a significant amount of market share and are able to run somewhat agnostic to particular subject matter. Now, at least from our perspective, uh, the thing that's really interesting about biotech and AI and automated laboratories generating data is that the friction is the value. So what I mean in terms of that is in terms of friction being the value, the harder the data is to collect, the more value you can actually generate out of it. That's why we've talked a little bit about a lot of nation states, a lot of different groups essentially hoarding some of this data because that's basically where you get most of the interesting ability to have commercializability. For foundational models, if we actually get down to it, it's roughly the same model. It's roughly the same data in terms of scraped data, legally or not, from the internet and say text or video or pictures. And then from that, you're able to do inference on it. 
But because a lot of these are similar, what you have is essentially just a high fixed cost in terms of being able to build up the computing infrastructure and then the ability to then run inference on it. Now, in terms of computing infrastructure, if we're talking about that, we're talking about a lot of companies raising a bunch of money in order to give that money to NVIDIA to build up the same kind of infrastructure that Google, Microsoft, and a lot of the big traditional computing companies already have. So the real interest within this particular area, again, is the data. Because within application areas, within, say, building on top of a foundational model and be able to branch off and have a very, very specific subject matter that you, only, that you are the only one who has the proprietary data on, that's where you'll actually be able to have pricing power and the ability to actually generate a more significant startup. Uh, I'd say that one of the things that we've seen is that AI for a lot of the companies that we've invested in, uh, especially within the application area, are a little bit more like the way that semiconductors or CPUs, or GPUs at this point, work on top of software. What do I mean by that? The proprietary data is ultimately the thing that's differentiated. And each generation of AI that we've typically seen has actually increased its ability to do things more and more and more. So the startups that we have are essentially able to take this proprietary data, take this area in terms of these models or whatnot, adapt them, and in certain cases where the model is less useful versus a newer one, simply swap out that for a new one. Now, in terms of the history and thinking about AI, I know that compute has been a very, very significant discussion, and I just said that compute as well is a very important thing within foundational models. However, if you think about, say, uh, I think one of the previous speakers had mentioned the change, say, 2010 and post, if you think about what was the difference between a lot of the time, per time period at that time, you didn't have many AI have the capabilities of hitting human levels of performance. In 2010, even Google had trouble telling the difference between pictures of not cats and cats. Post 2013, 2014, you had convolutional neural networks and representations on top of them that were able to suddenly make it much more viable to actually do this kind of computer, rec computer vision recognition. At this point, representations and pre-trained models have gotten so good, there's an open source project for home security where you can upload three pictures of your face and it'll be able to tell the difference between you and someone who's not you. And by the way, it can also tell the difference between cats, dogs, and other things in terms of coming to your local area. So things have advanced a lot, but I think we, it gets lost within the conversation about compute that the models themselves are continually getting better. But the models themselves, even though models themselves are not what companies compete on, what you'll see is some of these companies that have proprietary data sets be able to build self-reinforcing loops, where as they have the proprietary data, as they build better models against it, or use better models against it, they're able to sustain a competitive advantage where the generation of data continues on top of their platform, and they're able to gain greater and greater advantage within their particular application area. I think that's a really interesting trend. I think it's potentially one that we should worry about a little bit in terms of industry lock-in and also national competition. Uh, but it is a, something I think that it's important to think about as we go forward. Uh, and I think one last point that I'll just bring up just from a VC perspective, what we care about is specifically value created that's able to be captured by a small company. In terms of value creation. I think a lot of times value creation is talked about in a very general way, where if you create value, you can capture it, kind of. But as far as we see in terms of the economic models of how a lot of these different companies are currently going, a lot of the value generation will actually be socialized, meaning it's economic surplus. That's a good thing. Like that is traditionally, historically, the way that technological innovation has been able to broaden out and give benefits to broader society. There's also gonna be a significant account probably captured by large companies. And that's the ones with existing fixed cost compute that have been built in already. And then finally, we have the last group in terms of startups whose main differentiation will again, be their proprietary data sets. Now I've emphasized this a lot because we've talked a lot about data sharing. We've talked about incentives towards it. And I guess just as an industry represent, representative and commercial representative as well, I think one of the challenges will be to think about how do you actually incentivize that sharing 
when that data and proprietary data itself is almost the entire value of the company. So anyway, uh, just some comments and observations and yeah, been a great session so far. Look forward to questions and to speaking with the rest of the panel. So we have a, a question waiting in the room, but I uh, would like to to quickly ask the first, your your closing comment that data is the value of the company is really striking, particularly when we reflect back on the last two days where almost every single session, if not every single one, we've been saying, we need more data, we need more data, we need more data. Um, do you have any examples where companies you've worked with or other organizations are finding a happy medium where they're able to retain some proprietary element that they can capitalize on versus building data sharing mechanisms that uh, ultimately benefit themselves and their partners? I mean, it's tough. I've seen certain cases where the companies are able to sign agreements with researchers to use the data, but they can never share the data to anyone. So they're able to use these data sets. Those particular research will never be replicated because they won't have access to the proprietary data sets in order to do it. Because the tough part is this, right? Like, let me just give an example of one of our companies. Uh, I, I think they're great people. This is not to bring in like evil capitalist perspective or whatever. It's just trying to illustrate more of the challenge in terms of trying to incentivize people to do the right thing at the same time as you're also asking them basically give away the entire value of the company. We have a portable ultrasound company uh, or not. We have a company that uses raw acoustic data from ultrasound. For most hospitals, that data is thrown out. It's uncompressed sound data. Why would you even keep that? You usually don't even capture the stream of the ultrasound. You just capture the specific snapshots that you do. They've collected this data for years from hospitals. They're the only ones with it. And now that they have it, and now that they're able to show that they can do liver fibrosis uh, or show liver fibrosis from it, which you can't do from a 2D or 3D image, but you can with the raw acoustic data, any startup that comes along afterwards will say, hey, hospital, please, I'd like your data too. The hospitals will go, yeah, but now we know that it has commercial value. Instead of basically being free, we're going to charge for it. So as you gain these sort of cycles, you essentially have these little silos that will close off their data, not just from the startup perspective, but actually from the data vendors or hospitals or other entities who suddenly see value in this data and are able to monetize it for anyone trying to follow a startup that's demonstrated the value. Anyway, very depressing, but anyway, just. Very interesting, I'll say, but, but depressing too. Yeah, excellent, thanks. Thank you, Robert Fisher, uh, NSC. So uh, continuing in that vein, uh, I think researchers recognize the value of negative data, right? Um, and that's always difficult to capture. What I'm wondering is the type of data, um, it's a tough market for startups now. What happens to all the data that some of these startups have collected with the hope of mon monetizing uh, and then they don't make it? Where does that data go? Does it just go into a void? Is it never exploited, et cetera? Thank you. Uh, there's uh, more so in deep tech than in software. There is a, it's, and especially AI and data sets, there is a salvage value, meaning that someone will be willing to buy that particular data. Sometimes it's different entities that are other startups that are willing to pick it up. In other cases, it's strategic that players uh, say, certain Middle Eastern uh, sovereign wealth funds or whatever who are happy to pick up the data for cheap and then basically keep it and also sell it or uh, have it within their own ecosystems. Excellent. So with that, oh. Quick question on competitive advantage. So if you took off your industry hat and your VC hat for a second and you're now the president of the United States and you have to maintain a competitive advantage for the basic foundation of our economy in the 21st century and beyond, would you see a need for a national strategic stockpile of cleaned and optimized data that would feed everybody who's somewhat associated with a U.S. interest or U.S. industry and allies kind of thing? Or am I hearing actually a line of argument that says the biggest and fastest way to get high value is to commoditize that and let the market put a price on that data and let it compete out? Yeah, it's hard to say for that um, I, because like you can see it going in different ways depending on the specific industry and specific case. 
because like I said, each generation of AI actually brings down the order of brings down the order of magnitude of data required to do the same thing as the last one. Now that doesn't mean that we've stopped throwing more data and more computer problems because it does actually have a marginal benefit as we do that. But it's helpful to think about it from that perspective because you, I talked about that home security thing, right? So in certain application areas, the AI will get so good in terms of the pre-trained stuff or the stuff there or the representation of the specific format of the data that essentially you need a couple of data points. And suddenly it no longer becomes interesting in terms of proprietary data when anyone can come along and get 10 data points and basically replicate your results. That's an extreme, obviously, but if there's cases where you end up having the data get brought down in terms of order of magnitude so much that it doesn't matter. Now on the other side, especially for areas that are harder to get, like I said, friction is the value. The harder it is to get the data, the more valuable it is now that you have it. Uh, if, if I were thinking about it that way, I think the discussion group that we had and the breakout was actually kind of interesting in terms of thinking about a space race. Right now, biotech, from at least my perspective, seeing VC and a lot of biotech and healthcare is having a winter that's been very, very long. <laughs> Uh, in terms of VCs, it being out of style with VCs, at least outside of therapeutics. There's not that much interest in investing in a lot of these areas, even though there's obviously strategic value. It'd be interesting to have kind of a space race kind of thing like we were talking about towards it, where you can then have everyone centralized, be interested in actually helping contribute to this improvement. They can keep some of their data, they can make profit off of it, but at least the US government now has visibility on what's going on and it knows where all the different assets are, even if they don't own the assets. Because the trouble right now, if you compare now with say the space race era, we didn't have sovereign wealth funds or other entities from other countries who are happy to basically cut in line and say, yeah, deep tech's not that interesting to financial investors. But it's certainly interesting to us uh, if you are willing to, say, do a JDA with my company or in, in this country, uh, my sovereign wealth fund is happy to fund your entire like Series C or Series D. Just adding one quick point before we move on to, to Rob Carlson's talk. Uh, yesterday's panel on investment and gaps in, in those opportunities really pointed out that sector or that, that slice of uh, the investment landscape where there is no immediate commercial driver, therefore no immediate market value that would be capitalized on or anticipated by early investors and where there is opportunity for others to slide in and fill that gap. So something really to be thinking about um, in the context of this discussion, how are we better fostering that environment in order to maintain that as a national resource as well? One thing I'll just quickly jump in, at, just because from a VC perspective, it, I'm sorry. It's a, from a VC perspective, it's like, it's fine for me, right? But from a US citizen and looking at a perspective, look, if say, well, some entities I don't really believe, but say EDBI or Tomasek or whatever in Singapore, or say Ubadala and uh, the UAE basically say, look, this area of strategic uh, battleground companies that aren't commercially viable, well, maybe it is commercially viable if I give all of the loans necessary to do a first-in-kind pilot plant in my country, and actually you promise to basically bring over a lot of the IP and expand it within my country specifically. I will say those uh, proposals are happening quite a bit in terms of this particular sector because suddenly deep tech went in the past few years from an interesting area of science or within VC landscape and whatnot, a lot concentrated in say medical device or very specific areas to a geopolitical, of geopolitical interest to a lot of different uh, sovereign entities. So I'm going to, to pause us there because I, I know we have a, a lot to discuss ahead, but I wanna make sure that we get to uh, bring Rob into the conversation as soon as possible. So thank you all for the excellent questions so far and the excellent discussion. Uh, I know we have our own questions on the panel ready to launch as well. So thank you for your patience there as well. Uh, Rob, I think is joining us virtually. Hi, Rob. Hello. Uh, Rob Carlson is the Managing Director of Planetary Technologies and Managing Director at Bioeconomy Capital. And uh, Rob, I'll turn things over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have the honor and the challenge of going last. I can't see the audience, uh, but I assume the room is packed to the gills with people. 
were all wide awake uh, and on the edge of your seats. Um, unusually for me, I wrote out all my remarks, and that's a testament to uh, how thoughtful and thought-provoking everyone has been over the last couple of days. I'm sorry I wasn't there in person to partake, um, but I'll do my best to reflect uh, as well as address the questions that I was asked to address. Uh, I'm going to read it a little bit uh, directly from the page here, but also I'll, uh, I'll summarize um, and then see where we get to. So uh, I have one thought about, before I be, really get into it, um, about the kind of problem we're trying to solve. And the press today is full of reporting on the energetic capital environmental costs of training large models and all the um, processing, all of the data that we've been talking about. And the output of that expenditure, which requires uh, many megawatt hours and billions of dollars, is not always particularly impressive. And contrast that with the performance of a system that I used to work on, uh, my first project in graduate school, which was the flight control system of the blowfly, which learns to land with zero relative motion on the ceiling after just a couple of minutes of training, uh, burning at most uh, no more than microwatts. Uh, and so we have an inspiration that we can do much better than we are today. Uh, and also we have a hell of a lot of work to do to achieve that kind of performance. And uh, I'm, I wanna just put that out there. Maybe we're not approaching this problem right way as we think about training models, given the current architectures that we have. Maybe we should be thinking more carefully about other ways to solve this problem. And with that, I'll dive into the rest of it. Um, Biology is a general purpose technology. I didn't hear anyone use that phrase uh, at the meeting so far, but all of the discussions uh, certainly have pointed in that direction. And the Wikipedia entry on GPT, so this is not uh, GPT language model, this is general purpose technology, uh, are technologies that uh, can affect an entire economy, usually at a national or global level. GPTs have the potential to drastically alter societies through their impact on pre-existing economic and social structures. So this clearly describes biology. We're already seeing significant economic impacts from bi biotechnology in the US, and we're only just getting started. Moreover, participants in this workshop outlined a future in which various other technologies, whether it's hardware, software, automation, each of which is also recognized as a general purpose technology, will be used to enhance our ability to design and manufacture biological pathways and organisms that will then themselves be used to manufacture other objects. So we're stacking these general purpose technologies on top of one another. The US invests in many fields with the recognition that they inform the development of general purpose technologies. For example, we expect that a new chip architecture or control theory or indeed machine learning will each have broad impacts across the entire economy and in fact, our social fabric we we're finding out. Um, but historically in the US, investment in biology has been scattershot and application specific. So we're not recognizing it as the general purpose technology that it is. We do not have a strategic vision to describe what that is based on our behavior. We're certainly not spending money on biology in the same way as we do on those other general purpose technologies. So I have some hope that the recent focus on the bioeconomy and the creation of various congressional and executive branch bodies directed variously to study and secure the bioeconomy will help. But I'm on my third White House now trying to get the economic impact of biotechnology measured as well as we measure virtually everything else in our economy. And so far the conversation is still about how hard it is to imagine making this measurement. If only we could even decide how to do it. Um, and so we, in my mind, have to do better. We have to organize ourselves better. Uh, this is impeding innovation, getting to the theme of the panel, because we don't know how big this thing is. We don't know yet still really what we're talking about in terms of the size of the bioeconomy or its impact on um, other sectors or labor requirements or the impact of government investment. Uh, we're really ignorant still, and it's a self-imposed ignorance, uh, which is the worst part. If we were the only ones playing this game with no outside pressure, perhaps we could take our time and continue fiddling about as we have for the last 40 or 50 years. But of course, the context today is a pressure from many directions. We have, uh, we must have better biological engineering and manufacturing in order to deal with threats to and from nature, 
whether these are zoonotic pathogens, invasive species, or ecosystems in need of resuscitation or even rebooting. We face the real threat of engineered organisms or toxins used as weapons, and we face international competitor competitors who have varied, a very different perspective on the interaction of the state and political parties with the populace, and who have made very clear that they are out to dominate the global political economy of the 21st century, using biology as a significant and perhaps the most important tool in their kit. So if we want to compete, we need to do better. Um, I'm going to sort of dive into the things we were asked to address and reflect on some other stuff I heard uh, in the meeting. Um, in my experience, the most productive R&D teams are the most diverse teams, uh, whereby diversity, I mean, academic background, training, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, whatever metric you want, uh, innovation requires more brains, it requires the best brains, and requires diverse brains, and we need all the brains we can get. Uh, I do not expect this to be a controversial position in this venue, but alas, it is a controversial position in the larger political environment, and so I feel that we have to repeat it. Uh, and immigration, hiring, and social justice policies, whether enhancing or limiting, have concrete impacts on the capability of the U.S. to innovate, and therefore on our competitiveness and national security. However you want to measure diversity, the U.S. economy and national security benefit from maximum diversity in our scientific and technical workforce. The next point I want to make is that we live in a time where the national R&D agenda is seemingly set, if only by dint of the amount of cash being thrown around by private sector capital investment mechanisms and timescales. Uh, that money chases the latest fad, even if it doesn't make that much sense. Uh, and so many of the promises made by AI proponents, or call them advertisers, uh, are physically implausible, and some are physically unachievable given current model architectures. As a venture capitalist, I see proposals every day from companies that hope to make progress designing biological systems and products based on low quality data sets. And they're hawking the idea that AI can just sort it out, whatever that means. So needless to say, I don't write checks to those uh, people. Um, we're going through a period where we will spend a lot of money, we all together, and set many expectations for the future based on claims that are not technically achievable anytime soon. going to skip ahead here a little bit. Um, so to this issue of quality in uh, data sets. So the, you know, the way I think about this is error bars and all the all this data uh, and the large error bars, in effect, impose hard limits on how well any model can fit the data that's not in the training set or even fit the training set for that matter. Um, and that means that it's hard to use that model to do any real design because it generates poor hypotheses. Uh, as we've heard many times uh, just in the last few days. One benefit, however, of increased automation is the ability to redo lots of experiments with an aim toward generating data that has much smaller error bars and with uh, much greater reproducibility. So I suspect that, in fact, we're going to redo a lot of the molecular biology that we've done already with these better tools. One objective here uh, would be that it's my observation across our portfolio that Data sets with error bars above 10% don't give much ability to quantitatively predict the behavior of biological systems and aren't therefore particularly useful in supporting engineering and design. But once you get to error bars below 10% and especially below 5%, then engineering starts to work like you expect from experience in other fields. Um, thus, the high resolution, greater precision data sets will be extremely valuable, at least for a while. And I would offer the example of our Zeta. Uh, in our portfolio, who's been at it for, I think, 15 years now, uh, 17 years possibly. And they started tripping over the problem that when they attempted to do enzyme design, et cetera, the data sets, the public data sets that they were using were full of errors, uh, it turned out. And in order to make any progress whatsoever, they really had to develop all their own data, uh, make all their own measurements. Uh, and that has developed now not into a, a screening platform, but a testing platform. So they specifically design molecules to perform uh, quantitatively predictive functions, and then they test those things. They're not screening in the way that we usually use that word, and the result feeds back into their model. And now, even though I can't tell you about the actual product, that, that data set has supported um, their first commercial product, which is on the shelves. Their commercialization partner is, uh, has decreed that they will be in charge of the PR around this. Uh, and that actually raises a 
uh, an inhibitor to innovation for our Zeta. They'd love to get out and tell the story about how they can now design enzymes to accomplish chemistry, as we heard this morning, that can't be done otherwise, or to make um, chemical pathways much more efficient uh, and higher yield. Uh, that's a thing that exists now that they can do, but they can't talk about it yet uh, because uh, they are commercially impeded by their partner. This will change in the coming months, but nevertheless, uh, it's an, a thing I didn't anticipate happening uh, when they you know, made this big breakthrough and signed this commercial deal. So then the commercial impact of the, the engineering impact following on then the commercial impact of a data set that actually does allow you to do design, uh, does allow you to predict the behavior of the system you're working with, uh, is pretty important. And if we're taxpayers are going to pay for that, then how do we protect that data set? This is a question I've been at for a few years now. Um, if we collaborate with other nations to produce that data set, I do think that you know collaboration and competition is the way we actually make progress in the world, not fencing ourselves off. Um, how can that collaboration be structured in order to be equitable and beneficial to all parties? I, these are questions that we have to answer still. I don't have answers to them. Um, and then I wanted to touch briefly on a theme that I heard frequently that I'm not sure we dug into enough. I'll use this, I'll return to the specific example of regulating DNA synthesis. The larger question here is how do you uh, control, how do you regulate or prescribe uh, in some way or even monitor uh, a distributed manufacturing technology. We have uh, five centuries now almost of experience attempting to do that, going back to the printing press. The very first impact of the English crown attempting to control access to printing was the proliferation of printing presses in Scotland and the Netherlands. Uh, there was you know, no reduction in the amount of printed material available in England that the crown didn't like. And in fact, it, increased. Um, this seems to be a general example, uh, sorry, an example of a general principle that in large markets served by democratized production technology, restrictions on access to those markets and technology incentivize piracy and create insecurity. There's a lot in that sentence. Um, but if you treat it as a testable hypothesis, then his history provides many examples uh, that we can treat this data uh, with printing being the first one. Um, prohibition is a great example as well. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with that story. Uh, what pro the prohibition did was incentivize the proliferation of skills and the proliferation of markets to provide alcohol, even though it was supposed to prevent access, not just access, but the production. Anheuser-Busch made a quite a bit of money, thank you very much, during prohibition by selling uh, copper kettles and ingredients to make beer. Um, and then, uh, I found a nice quotation from a historian that uh, the law that was meant to stop Americans from drinking was instead turning many of them into experts on how to make alcohol. And in parts of the United States, more people were drinking and people were drinking more. So we have this proliferation that's caused by, that is in fact caused by the law intended to curtail proliferation, by the regulation intended to uh, curtail um, manufacturing and consumption. We saw this again with methamphetamines in the United States, the DEA zone reporting on attempting to uh, constrain this manufacturing technologies that they made the problem worse. Um, I would observe that, you know, we didn't have a problem with um, uh, homebrew submarines, cargo submarines until we cracked down on um, the ability of uh, drug cartels to move cargo around the world. And obviously I'm not in favor of them moving that cargo around the world, but also now that's a technology that didn't exist before and was incentivized by our enforcement activities. Um, and these examples go on and on, right? Um, we're doing an experiment right now today with 3D printing of, of guns. And the assertion is that we're controlling that except that if you go look at the data on who has access to those 3D printed guns and how often they're finding their way into the hands of people who use them, it doesn't seem that the restrictions are having the desired impact. In fact, it seems to be kind of productive again. Um, and I've left out the most important, most relevant example, which I mentioned at the beginning, and that is we've already tried to do this with DNA synthesis with the screening guidelines. Uh, and as covered by a meeting that was run by the International Council for Life Sciences in 2013 in Hong Kong, the immediate impact of introducing screening guidelines in the United States 
was the spinning up of a tier of DNA synthesis providers in China whose specific market was all the things that the screening guidelines were meant to prevent. Uh, so again, we have incentivized the uh, we have incentivized the uh, insecurity that we were attempting to curtail, and I fear that we don't reflect enough on these historical examples when we talk about uh, measures to improve security or safety today, whether it's DNA synthesis or it's access to AI or it's automation or what have you. Right? The history of these policies is not that they work particularly well, and frequently it's that they are counterproductive and they increase insecurity. Um, and there's another example of this, which I'm sort of scratching my chin about or watching, which is that uh, the DOD in particular is now funding distributed biological manufacturing in the United States as a means to facilitate uh, securing the bioeconomy and diversifying the bioeconomy. And I'm, I'm not sure that squares completely with the notion that somehow we ought to be controlling this as well. And I just don't think we've thought through all these things carefully enough. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to pause there. Uh, I want to end by saying I appreciate that uh, I appreciate the humility that I heard in the meeting, acknowledging that biology is hard and that biosecurity is hard, and that we really don't know what the hell we're doing yet. That's important. Um, but I worry that we don't show enough respect for the economic and political history of other kinds of technologies like this that we've seen develop. Uh, and that consequently we were repeating mistakes of the past or threatening to repeat mistakes of the past. It's important that we get this right. We're not talking about biology as we find it. We're talking about biology rather as we will build it. And we're just getting started with that project. And I look forward to collaborating with you all and making it better. Thank you. All right, I'd like to offer the opportunity for, for one question for Rob before we open up for a little bit of a broader discussion. Sure, I'll ask one. Uh, Tess Alexanian here. Uh, you know, you, you sort of finished off talking about um, respect for economic history of other technologies and also uh, you know, counterproductive offshoring of risky work to other places. I'm curious if there's any examples you think we should learn from around international cooperation on technology safety. You know, are there, I don't know if banking regulation is a good example, but are there are there places you'd say we should take as examples of how to make this work more, more internationally? That's a great question. I might have to give that some thought. Uh, I would observe that many times in DC, I am confronted after I present what I've just presented with the assertion that there are examples uh, that do work of regulation. And two of those examples used are frequently seatbelts uh, and guns. And uh, so seatbelts, as far as I'm aware, are not a manufacturing technology. They are a good example of uh, successful regulation but also the people being regulated, the subjects of the regulation have a clear incentive to comply with the regulation. They are much safer uh, than the alternative. Uh, guns also are not a manufacturing technology per se, uh, but also you know, no one who runs a machine shop uh, imagines that you can prevent them from actually uh, making all the parts of a gun, assembling a gun. This is not, the, the distributed manufacturing technology is metalworking. Um, and so, I will think more about uh, positive examples, um, but I'm not aware, again, of any examples of successful regulation of distributed biological manufacturing technologies. And the fact that there may be some, I just haven't found them yet. And so if anybody knows of one, I'd love to hear that. Um, but there are there examples from other sectors that could be useful models that we should explore that. I'm, I'm looking to the other panelists and, and seeing shaking heads. It, it seems like, uh, Tessa, you have stumped the, the crowd. If there are others that like to offer comment, now's a great time to open up the discussion, uh, certainly for, for additional questions, but also if there are observations or points that anybody here would like to bring forward, by all means, please do. 
Um, Teresa, I'll give you the honor of the first question for the panel, given that you've been waiting uh, for a few minutes to ask yours. Well, so, um, and it's really, you know, Rob and James, that both of you have talked about the value of data. Um, and, you know, uh, we just had an executive order um, around um, open data. So any data that is produced with public funds has to be open, you know, fair. Um, and so, and I'm like, okay, so none of that data that we're going to produce or any of the work that we do for the data of, for the bioeconomy is none of that valuable for innovation or maybe is it valuable for discovery, but not for innovation? Or is there a pre-competitive space where there is some value in open, well-curated, um, accurate um, data. Let's assume that that's what the, the starting point. So either one of you. I mean, sure, I'll, I'll jump in quickly. I mean, in terms of open data, like all of that is actually very useful in terms of driving overall innovation and economic improvements. Like the thing, the thing I was mentioning in terms of value capture versus value generation being different AI, including like LLMs and these other things, are going to have a huge amount of value generation. My assertion for some of these areas is they're not going to have a huge amount of value capture, which is good from a social policy perspective, because those accrue to people at that point, so socialized in terms of it. So in terms of the open data, absolutely it will be useful, generally speaking, and be able to drive forward the broader innovation economy. And uh, I just want to throw this in because I know it sounded a little doom and gloom about other countries and sovereign wealth funds and other things. It does, it, there's no guarantee that it'll work, right? Like lots of people have tried to recreate Silicon Valley by throwing money at the problem. And in general, that hasn't worked. It could be the case that yes, as you have a lot of open data, as you have all of the innovation ecosystem, the best academics, best researchers, best like companies being generated here, you would have that open data really be a driving factor in helping preserve that competitive advantage. So uh, yeah, just, so the answer is yes, at least for me. Uh, I would just say, you know, more data good, as long as the data is good. Uh, and then I, I'm, I'm flummoxed about how we kind of preserve taxpayer value uh, in some sense. You know, maybe the answer is we just, it's a benefit for humanity and we just put it out there. And that's not the kind of conversation that usually happens in Washington, D.C., at least successfully. Uh, and so um, maybe there's just a lot of work to do there. I would say that um, I have been involved in various studies of um, hubs of Silicon Valley-like things for 25 years now, uh, as well as people uh, intentionally create, uh, intending to create new ones. And I'm not aware of a single success story. Uh, all of the hubs that exist so far that in my understanding are kind of accidental, or we can tell a story that makes sense about how they came to be in Silicon Valley is a great example of that, you know. Um, but when you attempt to extract design principles for a hub, uh, whatever valley from that or other a research park triangle, whatever, uh, from those examples, and then you go and you make a prediction, you know, use that as a tool to try to do it again, then it doesn't work uh, or has yet to work. <laughs> Maybe, you know, it just takes so long that they will. But uh, I think this is a challenge for thinking about how to spread out the benefit and also spread out the creative capacity that we have so that we get more done. Hi, I'd be interested in everybody's thoughts about uh, how, you know, possibly the government or like another source could uh, incentivize private capital's mobilization for like the national interest and national needs. Uh, you know, often these areas have a lower ROI and the ROI comes in over a longer time frame. Uh, there are models out there, like for example, maybe using 10 million taxpayer dollars and then crowding in additional private dollars on top of that in order to invest in specific areas. Uh, but you know, very interested in your thoughts on incentives uh, to get private actors to mobilize capital for the national interest. Thank you. 
James, you want to start us? Sure. Or, or was that, you know more about capital. capital. I know about that. I've been the federal government. So. Well, I, I will actually say from the NSF and NIH and other folks, like that has actually been extremely valuable in generating a lot of this innovation, right? Because a lot of the companies that we invest in have gotten grant funding for many, many years, and some of them still getting grant funding at this point at the point of commercialization. And that comes after 10, 20 years, whatever it is that no private actor is ever going to put money against. And that's worked quite well in terms of the US model, uh, being able to fund a lot of the basic research or a lot of the research towards applications than having the commercialization happen within the private sector. Uh, one of the hobby horses I've been on a little bit now has been, yeah, it is kind of interesting at this point that you have a lot more strategic competition for these technologies, because again, they've suddenly become interesting from a national security perspective for other entities as well. Whether or not that will ever work is a big question. I mean, sort of speaking towards Rob's point, whatever, they don't invest in us anyway, so it's not a big deal. Uh, Singapore, uh, <laughs> Uh, Singapore's ecosystem is probably the ultimate example of an extremely designed startup ecosystem that is absolutely awful in terms of like this quality of the startups and a lot of things, not all of them universally, obviously, but for the most part, because the incentives are wrong, the culture is wrong, and a lot of the money that's just thrown at it is kind of thrown at it somewhat agnostic to the actual commercial value of the thing. And that obviously creates negative incentives and just sort of bringing that all the way back, I think think the challenge is thinking about a way to be able to put a carrot out there in terms of, okay, you have some sort of market or some sort of thing that you can commercialize this technology towards, even if it isn't like the private sector commercialization, but still not have the kind of thing where you're artificially investing in certain technologies, picking them and doing such a thing that you've created really odd incentive structures and now are supporting a zombie ecosystem, which in some cases with massive infusions of capital is all you do. You don't create real innovation, you just create a lot of zombie companies that get government money forever. I mean, and, and we've been uh, kind of are experimenting with different ways that we would de-risk technologies that come out of our you know, basic research grants or our SBIRs where we embed commercialization experts or other people, or we, or we, you know, we do some other things to try to, to move that along, but we are, we are experimenting. I don't think we, you know, but if there are ideas, we're listening. So. Uh, so for my part, I did spend a chapter uh, on my book some years ago on this very topic, uh, but if you don't want to read that, then I was inspired by a National Research Council report from decades earlier called uh, Funding a Revolution, which looked at, in a retrospective way, and how we got the internet and all the IT technology that surrounds the internet. How did the government spend money? How did that incentivize private sector to spend money? Um, you know, the, the phrase, the national interest is somewhat challenging because again, we have yet to articulate strategically what our nat national interest in biology is. It, it, I would say we're closer to getting that done today than we were a few years ago, but it's not like everyone I talk to knows what we're doing and is all pointed in the same direction. So uh, what is the national interest? Um, in the case of the internet and in many industries, that uh, have produced a huge amount of economic value eventually, the customer was the government. The customer was the DOD. Now we have a problematic, uh, a problematic point to identify is who in the government is going to be the, if we need that same dynamic, I'm not saying we do, but if we do, uh, who in the government is going to be the customer for biotechnology in this way, do we really want it to be the DOD? We certainly don't want it to be anything related to weapons. That's bad. Let's not do that. On the other hand, the DOD spends a huge amount of money on a variety of products. And uh, in my experience, the DOD, many pieces of the DOD, but also the rest of the government on the acquisition side, don't know, for example, that they are supposed to be buying things off the biopreferred list first. And so, you know, there is a customer there. It should be spending money on biotechnology, but isn't simply because uh, the government doesn't know that what the government is supposed to be doing. Surprised. Um, anyway, this all comes back to what is the national interest and are we all pointed in the same direction? And I, we're just not yet. So we could spend some time on that too. That would be useful. 
So we have a number of questions in the room and several online as well. I've been given license to eat into our next session a little bit, which we have done. So thank you for that, Grace. Uh, I will casually look to some of our organizers for either permission to proceed for a couple more minutes or, or okay, excellent. So we'll take maybe another five minutes here. And then our next session, our, our next breakout session is going to be really thinking about what a grand challenge might look like and kind of how we are thinking about cultivating and harnessing some of this innovation to accomplish some goal. And so I think very naturally, a lot of this discussion can be easily uh, segued into that session. And uh, Rob, hopefully you'll you'll join us there on Zoom and, and can remain part of the conversation. I don't want to cut this short by any means, um, but perhaps we can in the next five minutes transition to that setting instead. So with that in mind, uh, is that Tom? And uh, Yes, uh, Rob, you. it's Tom Knight here. Uh, I wanted to thank you for your really very thoughtful comments. I, I think they were spot on. Um, one of the things <clears throat> I was wondering whether in terms of the data acquisition, whether the focus that we should be looking at is not necessarily uh, collecting lots of data, but rather the sort of the meta goal of uh, making it easier to capture that data. You know, should we be thinking about ways of reducing volumes of, you know, needed in experiments, uh, improving the assay designs, uh, you know, thinking through uh, what the high throughput methods are that are going to be, make it easier to be dramatically more effective at, at creating that data. So for our panelists, if I can ask you to, to keep your responses short and sweet, that would be wonderful so we can get to one or two other questions in the room first. So I would just say yes, absolutely. And all, everything you said was critical to our Zeta developing that its internal high quality, low air bar data set that then supported its later engineering efforts. Great. And I would love to see us figure out how to collect data from manufacturing as well to put into that ecosystem. Yeah, totally. The more, if, if that is actually able to be opened and captured, it would also create an interesting competitive ecosystem because at that point, the data itself is also not as proprietary for especially these areas. Uh, so it, it's a question of national interest and sort of what we want to be uh, productized and profitable or not. Thanks, some great questions. Uh, our next. Hi, uh, Joe Russell, MRI Global. Um, I was curious on the panel's thoughts and just as we're kind of emerging into this new world order and the value of data in that world order, and also the concept of incentivizing innovation and, and the profit motive, but also open data and using data for all the ways that it could be used. Is Has it been your experience that there's a constraint or a pinch point in the way that our IP law around data or Creative Commons license or data use rights or just general patentability of that is is not well specced or constraining to the where we're moving into, or do you think that we're okay and we need to just fit to where we are? It's kind of a free for all right now, right? Like that's why New York Times is suing OpenAI and other stuff. It's like in theory, there's supposed to be laws and stuff around it. In practice, like for the most part, the data is being protected through effectively not releasing it or trade secret kind of things. Well, so there's, there are different kinds of data, right? The, the data that goes into chat GPT and or image, you know, generation models, that's copyrighted. That can be copyrighted. The quantitative data that you produce in your laboratory cannot be copyrighted. That's, that's natural product as it were. And so it's it's actually not clear how you protect that other than keeping it under your hat or you know obscuring it when you release by increasing the air bars and you know tweaking it in some way, filtering it in some way. It's not clear how you would protect that uh, from legal in a legal sense at all. Uh, another quick question, our last to wrap up the session, perhaps. Yes, I'll try to make it quick. <laughs> although it's a little bit of a big question and builds on some of the other questions. Um, what would be, what do you think would be the, this is for everyone, what do you think is the most effective um, new policy or uh, deregulation initiative or new business model or incentive 
to create the most important high quality uh, large data set for the bioeconomy. Quick question, but a tough one. <laughs> so unless, if they're quick or immediate thoughts on that, I, I welcome them, but I do think this is a great one to take back for that grand challenges discussion as far as, you know, what is that big problem and what is the data we need? And then how do we incentivize that generation? Uh, so I'll, I'll ask, yeah, quick yeah, comments. Just quick, that, you know, that if you ever read the bold goals report for the bioeconomy, they got buried someplace, but there was this piece of it of leveraging biodiversity across the tree of life and mining all of that data. I mean, that if there were public funds to do that, I think that there would be huge potential for discovery and then later on innovation. Um, uh, my, yeah. That would be my, on my wish list. Yeah, basic research funding has gone down a lot since the 80s and whatnot, right? especially since the end of uh, the previous strategic competition uh, that we had. Yeah, having more of that open data, more, new human genome project, new et cetera, like would definitely be helpful because everyone builds on top of it. And yeah, they branch off to be proprietary, but everyone builds on top of the base. I would say, I think it depends on what the data is for. I mean, there's data for the sake of science and for understanding the world. And so obviously I'm in favor of maximizing that. And, and the incentives around that, though, are different than data used to then make something of, of other and perhaps greater value. So just retreating to the example of our data, that the data they collected about enzyme function and structure and the ability to do atomic level design of enzymes and create new chemistry, uh, enzymes that create new chemistry or perform new chemistry. The, the value there is the enzymes and then also the product that the enzymes make. The data, you ha they had to have that, but the quantitative value of that data is much smaller than the product value eventually. Um, and so part of the challenge I see is us recognizing the value of those biological products in the economy so that we then appropriately resource all of the engineering stuff we have to do below that, including gather much better data. Excellent, thanks. So before we break, uh, I'd like to thank our speakers again for the wonderful discussion and very thought-provoking comments. I think we have a lot to, to carry forward into our next session. Um, so let's please do that. Thank you all. Um, as we move forward into our, our next breakout session, which I hope everybody will, will stay for, uh, we are tasked with thinking about a grand challenge, right? What's the actionable kind of opportunity in front of us that we can use to accomplish some of these goals we've been discussing? Um, we have a, a similar format to the session this morning. Uh, if you were in this room, you will stay in the same place in this room, or if in the other room, I think that was groups one through three, uh, please meet us over there. One thing I'd like to throw out, uh, just to, to continue the conversation on and pull some threads that we discussed here briefly, um, we talked a lot about data again, a lot about data again. So what are the other dimensions we also need to be thinking about folding into this discussion? Are there cultural elements, social elements, certainly regulatory elements have come up, even surrounding data. Uh, Kavita had a couple of questions in the chat for the last session regarding how we're working in low resource environments and what kinds of global or international partnerships uh, we need to be thinking about how we're fostering them, but also how we are guiding them. So uh, with those couple of elements in mind as well, uh, I'll invite us to, to take our seats for the next part of the, the day and uh, move on from there. So thanks everybody for the engagement so far. We'll see you in a few minutes. Just your
that's for all your questions and comments that you want to share that haven't been said yet. So that's the highest priority here. If, if something hasn't been said here, now is the time to please come up and use the mic on the left. And if you hear something from a workshop attendee now and you want to respond to it, please use the mic on the right to uh, have that dialogue. We, we definitely want to have the dialogue. We're, we're very aware that uh, both during lunch and, and the breakout sessions, there were a lot of conversations that were incomplete and you, you, we definitely want to engage uh, you all in those conversations. So please use this time to come up and share your thoughts. Anything that hasn't been said yet, but is still very important and needs to be on the record. Thanks, Jess. I'm happy to kick us off. I did forget which mic is which, so I'm sorry if I'm on the wrong side. But uh, one thing that I was hoping to address in the last panel that I feel like has been attention along the way has been the, the um, relationship between innovation and forward progress, how we're accelerating things and moving forward, and the security aspects and how we're mitigating those risks. And so it's very, very common to hear the, the refrain that we want security without impeding innovation and progress and so on and so forth. And so I'm curious to hear thoughts from others in the room um, as far as whether this is an issue that we are frequently encountering, if it's if, if it's more just uh, something we're anticipating running into, uh, and if there are good solutions for risk mitigation in other fields that have been successful without interfering with the forward progress or the pace of forward progress. So risk mitigation in other fields that have helped innovation without impeding innovation. Any thoughts? I will uh, stand down until somebody chooses to take the other mic. Thanks, Jess. Yes, please. Not the positive answer, but you it sounded like you were also asking for, are, there, are the trade-offs real? And I guess I just want to say, I think they are real. Um, uh, yeah. I used to work at iGEM, and so there you see the effects of export controls on like young scientists, uh, you know, outside in, in countries that don't have a lot of uh, biomanufacturing in country and also aren't close allies with, with countries that have a lot of biomanufacturing. So hearing about students who are waiting just like on the order of three weeks to three months just to get basic reagents for doing synthetic biology. And, and that's partly because both, you know, they're, they can't get them in country. They're, the people, their customs agents would sometimes just destroy samples at the border. Um, but also sometimes it's not possible for them to order them from certain countries. So I guess that seems like a clear example. Um, you know, I think also if we do implement customer screening requirements, which is something I advocate for, I think there are people who will be excluded. For example, uh, one issue I've been thinking about a lot myself is whether we should be requiring government issued ID uh, to access things like scientific reagents, things like synthetic DNA. I think, for example, I, I live in Berkeley, California. University of California, Berkeley has a policy on not asking anyone for government issued ID because they know they have, um, they serve communities who are undocumented, right? And so if we start introducing customer screening requirements more of the bioeconomy, are we then excluding, you know, potentially young scientists at the at the University of California, Berkeley? So that was not a, that was a negative rather than positive response, but just wanted to sort of by the flag of like the trade-offs are real and I, I think we have to be conscious of them. Thank you very much, Tess. Any other thoughts? Okay, uh, I'm curious to hear more grand challenges and I don't know if you were gonna address that later, but I just for, um, since we're given the opportunity to ask questions, we've been talking about AI and I feel like we're, um, you know, through conversations with other folks here, like we're just trying to see how we can use AI for bio, but instead of like thinking about what problems we want to tackle. And, and so I'm curious to hear what other grand challenges were discussed during the, the breakout session? Sure, yeah. So we'll try to squeeze that in in the last five minutes of the session. Somehow that's gonna happen as well. Okay, so maybe um, at least um, one or two sessions uh, or uh, breakout groups, if you wanna come up and summarize your grand challenges, uh, one to two minutes each. Any volunteers?
We can start. Uh, our group has talked about using, um, could we have in 10 years a peer reviewed paper that really uses AI from start to end? So the AI scientist kind of hypothesizes and comes up with their problem that they want to, to look into. There's a fully automated lab that kind of runs the experiment. It also writes. Um, and then at the end though, would it be peer reviewed by humans to kind of see how that's going? So that was one of our grand challenges. Uh, we had another one that was kind of called triage on a chip. Could in an emergency situation, um, could there be a phone app that is able to kind of scan injuries or scan a patient um, and provide recommendations for kind of stabilizing them before uh, emergency medical services or other first responders are able to arrive and provide more medical care? Um, and then our last one was in 10 years, could we develop uh, 10 times the amount of bacteria um, from of currently uncultured uh, bacteria? Uh, and so, yeah, that was our three grand challenges. Thank you. I am way too short for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had a lot of ideas. I will just cover a couple. Um, one of them was mapping the environmental microbiome. Um, there was kind of a couple that were centered around digital twins or just the ability to simulate and or predict kind of very complex uh, ecosystems such as a whole cell, which is so tiny, but it is so complicated, and also animals. So this would actually take out the needs for animals in animal studies. Um, and someone did reference that when, if we are trying to make the 100 day goal a thing, you probably cannot be assuming that animal models are the way you want to go. Um, capabilities like ecosystem regeneration, this kind of touched a little bit on climate, um, but I think the really interesting idea was the prediction of how interventions at a bioregional scale can improve resilience. Um, and then continuing on protein folding and um, whole genome models, because that is you know, still a work in progress. Um, I will expand a little bit, I think, on metrics of success. We talked about the ability that if we have, if we can make certain things in country that are currently being made exclusively outside of country, that we then have freedom from economic dependence on, you know, for certain things. Um, I think this is particularly key if we're talking about countries that we have a more adversarial relationship with or competitive relationship with. Um, also, this would help with executing out the bold goals, which should be a priority for us. And a point of personal privilege, I will say, um, I wanna add to our conversation is that one metric of success is that the things that we create from these grand challenges either increase equity or they are equitable in access. Excellent, thank you. I'll be fast. Um, we talked about data, um, which clearly illustrates how much of a problem and challenge that it is. Um, and I kind of feel like we've talked about it in two, but slightly different, but related ways. So we started with talking about the need to integrate sort of da data for manufacturing and scale up with data that's coming out of the lab um, and sort of um, having those two processes talk with each other and indicating that the US might not be doing the best job at this. But we also talked about, you know, how do we incentivize compiling data more globally and ensuring that we're obtaining data globally. And so this was kind of tied to the idea of forecasting weather as like one example, but like you could imagine not just forecasting weather, but like forecasting pandemics or climate disasters. And so there was a discussion about like, how do we incentivize people to actually do this? And then also, you know, how do we ensure data quality is good and correct, perhaps by compiling multiple streams of data. So not just self-reported, but also, um, but also like sensor data, physical sensors. Um, yeah. So I'll stop there to keep it quick. Thank you. I will share for our group. Um, so there were a few things. They're kind of all over the place. So free Emerald, uh, sort of free sort of cloud lab services for everybody to use. Um, we had, we talked about sequencing everything in the environment. 
uh, and that could be useful for all sorts of reasons. Uh, we talked about, um, sorry, just going through this. Oh, being able to uh, really understand everything that's happening in a very simple organism, understanding different types of organisms, you know, things that might uh, have some interesting physiological changes uh, or life cycle changes. Uh, we talked about um, increasing inclusion and participation of everybody in the uh, research and development phase for bioeconomy and uh, increasing science literacy broadly. Um, we also talked about having 100% AI integration into the system, uh, principles of practice. So being on the same page as to what, you know, how we would do things, things that are not as maybe fuzzy as norms, but something stronger than that. Um, we talked about identifying red lines. So what we are not gonna do, we didn't actually identify red lines except for one, which is to not create a pandemic. Um, uh, we talked about examples such as the International um, Harmonization sort of commission or committee, I'm not entirely sure what the C stands for, uh, as something to think about internationally. Um, and then to look at both the policy enablers and restrictor, restrictions uh, on both sides to really understand how you tip the balance in the favor of responsible innovation. And then the final thing is economic incentives for biotech. Sure, thank you, Kavita. <clears throat> Yeah, um, so we are, I'd like to address uh, both questions you raised here, why was not discussed, and then grand challenges. So we discussed about two aspects. One, AI application in really end-to-end -end development of biologics, which means discovery to manufacturing and the market authorization was not really discussed. It was mostly focused on the discovery aspect of AI. So that was missing. So that is one of topic for our grand challenge. And the second one is we always suffered from this uh, supply chain interruption by un, um, un, unpredicted events like geopolitical conflicts, like Ukraine war, climate changes, and how we can address this by using AI. I think that was not also discussed. So I will quickly uh, comment on the our end-to-end -end manufacturing uh, strategy for AI, and then Justin is going to cover the second one. So, um, so grand challenge, the, the, our goal here, we are just uh, throwing this out, let's say drug price is too expensive. So we can we need to uh, drive down the drug price. How can we do that? Firstly, we can, there are a lot of uh, potential approaches, but based on what we learned from these two-day workshops, certainly there is enough um, capability to design more potent drug. That is what AI can do. And then also there are a lot of other technical areas like digital twins, AI power digital twins, how to automate, how to you know, control, better control using AI to reduce the batch failure in manufacturing. And that those can help to uh, potentially drive the cost down, therefore justify the price down. So that is the one of the grand challenge topic. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is definitely a topic of my personal interest as well. Yeah. And it's, Unfortunate because um, it's important, everyone recognizes it, but it's also very expensive, so no one does it. And then we come back to, to meet and then we say, oh, it's very important, but it's too expensive. And we keep going in those circles. Yes, well, I, yeah. I think, uh, you know, another group hit on it, but right, we're, so we're talking about biotechnology, we're talking about AI and automation. And it seems like, you know, it's, especially if it's a drug, that is, and I think we saw some of this with COVID, it's a drug or a precursor for a drug which is produced in another country, the supply chain halts, and that causes a whole bunch of shortages and stuff like that. It seems kind of like really in the wheelhouse of this particular topic that, you know, if you combined, you know, engineering microbes to produce high concentrations of a particular drug, putting AI into the system so that it can monitor for and, you know, actually manufacturing the drug itself or, you know, the apparatus around manufacturing the drug or, or monitor to make sure that the batches are appropriate. Um, those things in combination with, right, the, 
the automation itself could theoretically allow us to bring manufacturing back here or at least have facilities that if needed could be spun up to produce a drug if there's a shortage of that particular drug so i think right in a 10-year time horizon drastically reducing drug prices as well as having the ability to kind of compensate for any uh, shortfalls we might see due to unforeseen events yeah that was it. so if if i may paraphrase you're talking about self-driving labs and self-driving bioreactors with modular downstream processing so we can go through that process very very quickly so we can manufacture as needed in in the u.s for the population of the u.s exactly thank you yeah any other thoughts, comments? Anything that hasn't been said yet that needs to be said and recorded? This is your last chance. I have more takes. Uh, one, one thing I think we haven't discussed very much or I haven't heard discussed very much is the extent to which we want to move towards a centralized world of biomanufacturing and automated labs or a decentralized world. You know, do we want a robot arm in every lab or do we want to have, you know, large biofoundries and have a lot of, you know, biology undergrads who do most of their experimentation or, you know, grad students doing most of their experimentation at centralized foundries that might not even be in their university. I think this has a lot of implications both for how we want to invest and what enabling technologies are missing and it also has a lot of implications for what security posture we should be taking towards this so I, I guess I just wanted to put that thought in people's mind too is as you're picturing a world with I mean it applies to AI as well right are we going to have useful tiny models that you know anybody can run on a somewhat expensive MacBook or are we going to have entirely massive foundation models that can only be run in a very small set of places um, so for both AI and automated labs, thinking about whether we're moving towards a decentralized or a centralized future seems important to me. Uh, well, I guess if we have a heavily, if we have heavily decentralized capabilities, then I think, I, I mean, yeah, so let's imagine a world where we end up in a case where we have heavily decentralized DNA synthesis. So every lab has their own benchtop synthesizer, but then we have heavily centralized strain construction because there's a dozen labs that are really good at outsourcing strain construction and you always send your strains to be constructed there. So I don't think it's necessarily either or. It, it could be kind of some, some capabilities end up decentralized and some end up centralized. So if I could add a thought to what uh, you just shared, Tess. Um, I, was, I, I am co-chair of a workshop series organized by Society of Industrial Microbiology and Biotechnology sponsored by Schmidt Sciences, uh, where we looked at what kind of pre-competitive knowledge base could help the biomanufacturing industry. And we invited many uh, experts from industry, academia, national labs, and, and federal government. And we found that um, industry, they don't want to share data, but they're willing to share models. So in, in a distributed world where uh, each company has their data with them, but they were still willing to share models, so more like a federated uh, learning more approach, it's, it's possible to get to a point where we are centralized in our knowledge, understanding of how things work, but not necessarily have access to all the data that got us there. And um, the report of that workshop series will be out very soon, so you can learn more from it. Uh, we are at time, 3.20. Oh, no, please, please do. I definitely don't want to refuse anyone who has a thought. One brief comment is I think we also as a community need to assess what skills should be retained and what trainees should still learn. And so, for, for instance, I've had some conversations over the course of this workshop with some people about does do people still need to learn how to code or is AI going to code for them? Or if there's an automated lab, do you still need to have trainees learn how to do wet, wet lab work? And the answer could be no in some cases. But if we lose those skills and we need to do some validation internally, that's a potential challenge. And this has also happened, for instance, anecdotally, I've heard in some medical fields, when advanced therapy or advanced diagnostics have come into play, trainees no longer have to do the invasive test and they no longer learn how to use it. And that still needs to be done just in a very rare set of patients, but there aren't necessarily the right training sets for that. So that's something that I think is maybe an evolving question that everyone is going to have to think about as, as we move forward. 
That's that's a very important comment, and I think that's what uh, Dr. Frances Arnold was kind of trying to refer to this morning when she was talking about biomanufacturing workforce in other countries that we we don't necessarily have here, and and um, I also envision AI for training. Can we take our skills right now and have AI teach that to kids? So then they're not learning coding, but they're learning how to use a bioreactor because AI is teaching them that can scale much faster. Any other thoughts? All right, I'll hand it over to Amna. Uh, thank you, Deepti, and I'd, I'd like to start with a summary of where we are and what we've accomplished in two days. It's been exciting two days. Um, just want to check that we have the, the right slides. We have the day one summary right now, so we're going to flip to the workshop summary and conclusion, and I'll get started. If we could flip to, oh yes, there we go. Uh, thank you. So as Deepti mentioned, we heard a very inspiring talk and the next slide summarizes Dr. Frances Arnold's seminar this morning and her uh, Q&A. So if you could flip to the next slide. There you go, thank you. Um, Dr. Arnold revolutionized the field of protein engineering and enzyme engineering, is still revolutionizing it. And she's doing it through applying evolution and understanding natural biology. And so her emphasis of her talk was not only to look at what we, what we do know, but look beyond what biology tells us right now. And among those, she described how she's already using machine learning and has been for over a decade and how she sees AI and machine learning influencing the field. Um, more than that, she also described some of the challenges and opportunities we have in terms of automating laboratories to produce new enzymes and proteins, and also what we need in terms of the data. And we've heard that repeatedly, the data, and also Teresa mentioned again, also keeping humans in the loop because there's information that we'll lose by, by losing the human interventions, by losing uh, the, the additional creativity from the humans. So that was a very inspiring talk to kick off today. And the next slide goes over a quick summary of who we had on our first session of today, the fourth session of the overall workshop. So if we could um, see if I can flip, but there we go. Um, so we heard uh, from, from Tame about the pace of computation and some elegant slides sharing that the data is increasing and accelerating at such a rate that what took 60 years now is taking 13 years. So a tenfold build, billion increase in the speed of computation and the speed of science um, is estimated since 2010. Um, Erica shared that she saw a key milestone in AlphaFold, in Google's AlphaFold, um, and it had been defined 50 years in advance as a grand challenge. So in thinking of that, we're thinking of grand challenges now, can we also set the stage for new technologies? Um, one of the key things that she mentioned in her talk is that, again, the need for large high fidelity data sets with an emphasis on that was the hardest part that it took uh, over $10 billion of data to produce PDB where it is right now. And so to think about that as we're expanding and, and what her, her company and her institute is doing, um, her, her nonprofit as well for, for generating data sets. Erza uh, uh, shared with us uh, predictions of what people, both experts and non-experts in AI and the public felt about the catastrophic risk of certain different, um, uh, different risks, including AI, and showcase that right now experts uh, would put AI at, at a 20, 12% risk compared to an engineered pathogen at 3% risk compared to a natural pathogen at less than 1% when you're asking about something that could cause a catastrophic loss of life by the year 2100. Uh, 2100, um, then the public is less concerned. He pointed out that the public only ranked AI with a 5% a catastrophic risk. Um, and, and his question is, and what he's studying is, how do we change that, that projection of risk? What are the factors that can implement, uh, that we can identify that could uh, change public opinion and expert opinion? And what is the, how can we uh, better pinpoint um, where our predictions fail and where they're successful in identifying risks? 
Um, we also heard in the next session, and Phil uh, echoed um, Erzo's uh, points, he also shared that, um, that even though that different perspectives were shared in the framework, the adversarial operational framework of the, of the survey that was proposed, uh, there was little change in the, in the experimental um, outcomes of their forecasting, which um, brings us maybe to, to what we heard what was more positive on the fifth session. And I wanna share a little summary of what we heard in the fifth session. Um, and we heard from Teresa Good at the National Science Foundation. She talked about how uh, Kate gave a, a couple of examples of empowering people with many resources and infrastructure and starting to enable the democratization of biotechnology. And more broadly, can we do the same thing for AI technologies? Um, she mentioned the, the key point, can we start to innovate with measurements? Can we think about how we quantify um, the AI's influence and also that was echoing what we heard on day one. Can we get better at sensors, sensors for the biotech, but sensors also for the AI? Um, another thing Teresa echoed was what uh, Dr. Francis did too, uh, Dr. Arnold Francis did as well, is that keep humans in the loop of the design, build, and test process, and also still consider bespoke processes and variation to bring in new ideas. Um, and then also in the next generation of biotech, let's be open to the idea that we can consider bringing in security into the ecosystem. Um, we also heard in this same session from James Wang on Creative Ventures. He also emphasized the key importance of data in augmenting and improving and innovating in AI, uh, sharing that he felt proprietary data is a distinguishing factor, not the AI methodology itself right now for most biotech and biopharma VCs. He felt there's a very strong interest in biomanufacturing among his cohorts of VCs that he, and his colleagues. He felt also there's an important difference between value capital and value generation. And then um, uh, summarizing this session, we heard also from Rob um, Carlson, and he described that there needs to be a measure of impact of the bioeconomy from AI. We still need to quantify this better. And he also stressed what we've heard throughout this session, these two days is that most innovative teams are diverse diverse in their fields of discipline and in their background and in, in their de uh, demographics. Um, so one of the things that the next slide highlights is that we can start to, uh, we've all been throughout this whole workshop, identifying ways that we can understand what are the opportunities, where we are now, and what are the risks we have. We've, there's been a lot of discussions around those points. I wanna share where we are as a summary from today and yesterday. Uh, that we are knowing that AI and automation are already transforming the biosciences. And there's a long list of them here. There's many more coming. Um, among them, of course, we, we heard from some, some our keynote speakers or speakers describing that AI is requiring a new way to think about research and development. This was from the CEO of Benchling. It's also bridging the gap between digital and physical worlds, or wet and dry labs. We also heard that it's revolutionizing AI is really changing. Um, how we can search for microbial dark matters and how we can start to automate laboratories across uh, different sectors um, from Adrian Horfrost. We also heard um, more on the venture capital and the investment side, the idea that there's from, from Chinese Zhang, from InQtel, that there is some areas which are really good fit for venture capital and that have a strategic value uh, for, for others in the sector as well, that are good for, fit for government. And then there's a battleground of companies within those sectors, which both areas might, both VCs and, um, and the government would be good to, to invest in. Um, so I'd like to summarize uh, this by a, a slide that, um, that Doug uh, and others have really referred to and brought up the idea that there's many different areas of the design and test cycle um, and build cycle that there's opportunities and also areas where we can address security issues. Uh, so these are uh, among them here, and, and, and with that, uh, I'd like to just um, summarize then a little bit about where we can think of uh, going forward and, and echoing what we heard yesterday and today in our breakout sessions of what might be our milestones. Uh, so one of the, some of the things that were highlighted were we need to have AI address societal goals. So these need to be big pictures. The metrics need to be things like, uh, can we um, change climate change? Can we uh, impact the energy, energy cycles and agriculture and health? Can we enable predictable biology and understanding function from structure to materials? Can we enable faster and safer medicines? Equitability was also a key um, emphasis across many different discussions. 
but scientific workforce and understanding its needs as we change with AI. It's also a key thing that was echoed across the um, workshop. And uh, I put in there also, um, the, there were a few discussions on, can we use AI to better understand how humans are learning and uh, the, the human um, process of understanding and building and innovating. Some of the obstacles were brought up and this one was echoed over and over again, data and databases uh, and uh, lack of standardizations among them. The infrastructure and workload was emphasized. And then this emphasis, which is also in the field of AI more broadly on needing explainability, transparency of AI, equity, equity and cybersecurity. Uh, data sharing also would be empowered by having all of those in place. Uh, what are milestones and metrics? Well, uh, many of you contributed to, to this slide. Having less time in research and development and allowing to fail fast was some of the milestones and metrics that people cited. Having self-driving labs and the quantity and numbers and the advancement of those labs. Of course, more of the standard methods, publications, discoveries, and patents. And drug approvals, uh, costs were among the other things listed. Optimization of protocols for development of new biotechnologies and jobs. Um, where are the opportunities? And this echoes, I'm not going to uh, read it all, I'm, it echoes what, what we summarized yesterday, uh, the idea that there needs to be more sensing modalities, a change in mindset, uh, new policies and incentives. But I want to add two things from today's sessions, that is thinking about newer AI methods to help self-monitor and guide development of AI, and also really focusing on the last bullet point here, identifying who are the key stakeholders and who are the consumers of the AI and tailoring approaches to them and also understanding where the biases are when we're developing AI for them. And then the last bullet point, which Jess also echoed, can we quantify success as we're capitalizing on this excitement as well as bringing in guidelines and frameworks and proofs of concepts. With, with that uh, summary, I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew who has, is gonna finish up our workshop with actually a, a summary of AI. And I'll be, excuse me, I'll be real quick since I know we're a little over time, but DP joked yesterday that none of our remarks and none of our materials to date have used any sort of AI until now. I, I dropped this into uh, the word cloud. This is pulled from all the collective definitions that you all provided uh, yesterday. And there were some pretty interesting insights that I saw. Um, but kind of both very much speaking to, to some of what DB just spoke, deep, um, Amina uh, and others have spoke to, but uh, really over the course of this workshop, thinking about very much the opportunities that we have in the space to, um, I see the word solve here, the a um, uh, lot of opportunity space um, in, in that realm, but also the challenges that exist with, with the new technologies. I also drop these in um, here. So thinking if we could come up with a collective definition and I won't go through all of these, but um, I think it was just interesting to see what ChatGPT spit out for, for all the responses that received, that, that we had received. And I think just uh, looking at things like biotechnology kind of spoke to the, the, the wide breadth of opportunity that we have um, that Amina just said again, kind of the ability to develop products and solutions that, that improve human health and agriculture and so many other things um, that we've been speaking about throughout um, throughout the last um, two days. Um, so with that, I want to uh, conclude the workshop really with just a last um, a couple few words, one of which very much thank you all for, for those of you still here in person and those of you online um, for, for kind of sticking with us to the end. And thank you all for really the, the productive conversation and discussions throughout the, the the past two days. I kind of joked with some others. I think I think just hearing and listening in on the conversations, I think I could have built out, we could have had a full another day of agenda of just the, the really thought provoking discussion. Um, but I think um, definitely want to call out again and say a, a huge thank you to our planning committee, uh, Deep D and Amina serving as our co-chairs, along with Doug and Greg, Jessica and Arvind, who helped put this together in a, in a pretty quick timeline. Also want to thank again all the, the National Academy staff who assisted in um, facilitating it, especially a big thanks to our, our uh, tech guru, Eric, who's been managing our kind of hybrid situation. So thank you so much uh, to, to him as well. Um, a lot of great ideas, like I said, um, just wrapping up, kind of thinking of it's certainly not the end of this of the discussion. As I mentioned yesterday, all the outcomes from the workshop will be captured in a proceedings and brief that will be published in the ensuing months. Um, and, and certainly there's a lot more work to do as we we kind of um, heard throughout the last two days outside of even just this, this workshop. Um, the webcast recording will be available as well online to kind of capture all the discussions. Um, and then the last thing that I want to mention as well is um, the, Na the National Academy's just kicked off uh, and the 
call for nominations is open for a new consensus study related to a lot of the topics around AI and biosecurity. Um, so if you haven't had a chance yet, there was a, a handout. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, that's um, an immediate next activity that, that has already started that is very much related to all of the topics that we've had uh, discussions about the last the last two days. So with that, I'll, I'll close the workshop and thank you all so much again for the, the lively discussion. Thanks.